Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and a warm welcome to the second Central Army Leadership Conference for 2021. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Langley Sharp, Head of the Cal, and as is customary now, I'd like to start with a, a few thank yous. Uh, firstly, to Major Ben Acton, uh, SO2 leadership here at the Cal, and, and really this event is, is Ben's. Um, he's put a huge amount of work and effort into this many late nights. So Ben, thank you very much indeed. Um, firmly shoulder sh to shoulder with him in support has been W1 Chris Nickel, the senior soldier here at the Cal, chief moderator and chief eyebrow raiser. I'm um, also to thank uh, Brigadier Bill Wright, Brigadier Army staff, who is chairing this morning's session and a real ambassador for the, for the Cal. So Brigadier, again, thank you very much. And finally, uh, Dr. Linda Riso, senior researcher at the Cal Research Institute. And Linda will be chairing this afternoon's session. So thank you to all you all. So why this conference and, and why now? I think it's fair to say that um, there'd be very few people in the audience that haven't been affected one way or another by the events of the last 12 months. Many of us have had our working environments and our social environments very much affected by, by this pandemic. And we've had to face the challenges of remote working. And indeed now facing the challenges of hybrid workforce as some people return back to the workplace whilst others remain at reach. But what does this mean to our leaders and our leadership? How can you really know your people, build and sustain effective teams, remain trust within your team, develop a positive leadership culture and communicate with effect and not least lead by example. How do you do that at reach? For the military, of course, this is not just an, an in barracks or on the staff uh, issue. This is about how we fight and how we operate. How we lead a dispersed warfighting division, as in 3DIV. How to lead a persistently and globally engaged division, as in the 1st UK Division. Or how to lead a breadth of specialist teams delivering information manoeuvre and unconventional warfare, as in 6th Division. And of course, the challenges of leading remotely are not confined to the military. Whilst our context may be somewhat unique, it is important to us as an, as an organization that we continue to listen, learn, and adopt best practice from partners across defense, our partner partners and allies around the world, and indeed across the breadth of the public and private sector, all of whom are represented here in the audience today and indeed on our panel. And a warm welcome to, to everyone here uh, not least our partners and allies from around the world. And we're represented here by over 25 countries, which is fantastic. And of course, it is incumbent on us all, both military and civilian, to continuously learn and adapt if we're gonna face these uh, complicated and complex challenges of the future together. And on the future, specifically the future of war, I quote the following from a very credible senior leader. Whatever form it takes, one thing is reasonably clear. Modern war, with its destruction of bases, disruption of communications, and disorganization of control, will, if they are to operate at all, compel armies to disperse. Dispersed fighting, whether dispersal is caused by terrain, by lack of supplies, or by the weapons of the enemy, will have two main requirements skilled and determined junior leaders, and self-reliant, physically hard, well-disciplined troops. Success in future land operations will depend on the immediate availability of such leaders and such soldiers, ready to operate in small independent formations. The use of new weapons and technical devices can quickly be taught to develop hardihood, initiative, mutual confidence, and stark leadership takes longer. And for the keen-eyed historians amongst you, you recognize those words of those of Field Marshal Slim in his seminal work, Defeating to Victory, written in 1956. And so from a historical perspective on the future to today's view, delivered by our first guest, it is my privilege to introduce Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Mark Carlton-Smith. General, a very good morning. 
Langley, thanks very much indeed, and good morning to you all from Army Headquarters. Um, it's a fascinating program that the Centre of Army Leadership have put together for us all, uh, and it's a clear indication of a new way of the world uh, as we've become that much more familiar with a digital and remote landscape. Um, certainly, as you know, one of the very first task force commanders in Baghdad in 2003-2004, working for General Stan McChrystal, who you'll look forward to hearing from later in the morning. Um, we were operating in a world with no Skype. Facebook hadn't been invented. Twitter at that stage was birdsong. And if there was a cloud at all, it was normally something that rained on you. But with that extraordinary industrial American application, General Stan and his task force built a network to defeat a network. And in so doing, he put together a digital community of interest that linked continental United States with the principal theaters of operation, which then were Afghanistan and Iraq. And tactical task forces were able to communicate with each other in real time sharing firstly intelligence and also importantly, tactical lessons. And that generated a precision and a tempo that meant we were over time able to simply overwhelm Al Qaeda in Iraq. Now we've lived over the last 12 months through another period of unprecedented change in both our professional and our personal lives. And a watchword for all of us has been the nature of resilience. Uh, and resilience for my money is the ability to absorb a shock, to adapt and then to reemerge even more competitive. And so during the course of today's events, just reflect what price you, know, you and we the nation have put over the past year on the integrity of our supply chains, which has kept our families fed, on the resilience of our national digital infrastructure and what the experience of the pandemic would have felt like if we had not enjoyed that connectivity. And finally, on the capacity and the residual resilience of our public health services. But the challenge, of course, tomorrow isn't only a global medical emergency. It is also, of course, that unrelenting pace of change which is supercharged by an accelerating technological revolution. And that throws up several very significant institutional challenges because disruption seems to be the law of tomorrow. Now for my money, the crux of the issue, and one again that should be a light motif running through the day, is that the army is fixed with an industrial age skill set in some respects, an industrial age mindset and associated culture, when the reality is we're confronted by an information age problem set and the gap between those two positions is only growing more rapidly. And so the pace of change is outstripping the ability of our institution to reapportion resources in order to keep up. And new technologies are rendering old systems obsolete even more rapidly. But not all of this is negative because that technological progress also comes with some very liberating and democratizing effects. And it has, this last year, unleashed a wave of great innovation and opportunity across the army, but never more vividly than in our junior ranks. And there are plenty of examples that we can all draw on as to where that has demonstrated great progress this year. But the litmus test for our leadership is the ability to navigate this new inescapable reality. And that is how to keep up with the pace of change and how to reimagine how it's going to influence our business in the future. Since the theory of warfare is no longer keeping up with its actual conduct. Now the sort of the function and the application of command and control in the military context has actually, of course, historically always changed with technological progress. And we now all carry around more computing power in our pockets than the original lunar module held. 
It's worth noting, almost as an aside, that the average age in mission control in NASA when man landed on the moon was 27. And so it leads me to reflect on when organizations are conducting completely groundbreaking initiatives and going in to entirely new domains and realms where no one has ever been before, what price do you want to put on traditional qualities around age, wisdom, experience, and seniority? An institution today commanded by me, age 57, man lands on the moon, average age on the ops center, 27. Now, whilst the experience of the pandemic has meant that our own personal geography has shrunk around us and tactical time has almost slowed to a complete halt. We've lived nearly a complete 12 months of practically Groundhog Day. At the very same time, our digital reach has expanded exponentially. And we've been doing work remotely that we would never have imagined even this time last year that we would be able to. And indeed, no one would have conceived that the nation's children would have spent the best part of an academic year sat at kitchen tables around the country. And we've managed to create extraordinary levels of international collaboration just at that very same juncture when borders and sovereign territorial integrity have come back into fashion. Only last week, I was talking to Kate Bingham, which is not necessarily a familiar name to many of you, but those of you who do recognize that name, she's the woman who led the vaccine task force and has led to this extraordinary success that we're enjoying with respect to the vaccine rollout. Now she established an international collaborative consensus in order to deliver that range of vaccines to the UK. And she told me that she had never physically met any of the people she was dealing with. And yet they delivered something extraordinary in a time frame that was considered 12 months ago to be unbelievable and had never been done before. I think the principles of leadership, however, you know, frankly, are probably enduring. It's simply the medium that's different for all of us. But in our game, there are some specific distinctions around command, around leadership, and around management. And put very briefly, command favors a more formal hierarchical model, and that ultimately relies on an authority that's vested in an individual by virtue of his formal position. And that tends towards a model of compliance. Leadership by comparison is a much more human enterprise. It's often actually at its most effective when it's done in close physical proximity. But strategic leadership, of course, there are plenty of examples where strategic leadership favors something around decisions that are much more ambiguous, much more complicated, much more difficult to reverse out of once those decisions have been made. And you can picture families clustered round their wireless sets listening to the BBC as Churchill led the nation through the crises of 1940, remotely through the power of language and voice alone. But leadership, when all is said and done in our military context, is about persuading people to do something probably that they'd rather not do and or, and or otherwise to raise their game. Management, meanwhile, is a much more scientific approach, and it's a discipline around the application of data metrics. It's something that you can measure, and it's probably the relationship between outputs and inputs. But we now appreciate much more than we have done that almost all of that we can do remotely. Some of it is probably best done remotely, and even in specific circumstances, direct command and leadership can be done on the net. But the discipline is different. It requires for all of us much greater emphasis around clarity of vision and purpose, a clearer expression of the freedoms and constraints that you're prepared to confer on subordinates, and then a responsibility to articulate the risks that you're prepared to tolerate. And then quite frankly, the emphasis is on trust and delegation and allowing people to get on with it. 
because we don't want the technical tools and the digital proximity that they allow us to lend to an emphasis on over control because in these respects less is definitely more you want to ask the right questions of people but only those questions and the danger of course is interference whereby people use the technology not simply to add value but actually to stifle momentum and initiative we're all familiar with that iconic image of President Obama and his immediate national security team sat in one of the White House Situation Centers watching the Osama bin Laden rail raid unfold in real time. The trick there was simply they were observers. They weren't seeking to reach in, to control. But that's a discipline that military commanders need to maintain. We also need to be conscious that we've got to be careful about not tending towards a bias, that somehow techno technology will allow, enable us to make the perfect informed decision. It may do, but that decision will almost inevitably be late and therefore irrelevant. And the reality for all military commanders is that you need to be wherever is best suited to making the crucial difference and wherever you need to make the really key decision. And that key decision is one that only commanders can make. And the commander's tool set today is greater than it's ever been before. But you'll all reflect that where and when you can, we're in a human endeavor, and there is always a time to get forward, a time to judge how much more gas is left in people's tanks and just how white is the color of their eyes. So have a very good and fascinating program through the course of today. Thank you to Langley and his team for putting together a fascinating cast of contributors and I hope you all find it invaluable. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic introduction uh, to today's conference. Um, for the audience, I am Brigadier Bill Wright, Brigadier Army Staff. Uh, from the Army headquarters. Um, I'm delighted to be with you hosting this morning's session. Um, it is a subject, uh, leading remotely, that I am very passionate um, about. My journey uh, began as commanding one armored infantry brigade as the Army came out of Afghanistan and we looked at modern war and how, and future war, and how that will operate, the dispersed battlefield, digitization, and what that meant for us and our tactics. But critically, as CGS has alluded to, the leadership and human behaviors element, how you maintain trust at distance and have those difficult conversations in dangerous and threatening times and maintain that relationship um, of trust. Uh, I continued on that theme um, as Commander Santos Group, working with General Paul Nansen um, and the Center for Army Leadership, looking at leadership training um, now uh, and into the future and the challenges uh, and opportunities that lie ahead. And now as Brigadier Army staff uh, within the Army headquarters uh, for the last 18 months, I'm tasked with developing future ways of working. So what does the workplace look like for all of our people uh, in the future? And what we can bring from our current and our battlefield experience or training experience into the workplace and what can we learn and, and share with the commercial sector, which is why it's so fantastic to have uh, so many people in today from a wide breadth um, of different um, so that we can lead our people um, into the future and into the digitized uh, world. So to kick off uh, our speakers this morning um, on what's going to be a brilliant day, I can think of no one better to set the context than uh, Professor uh, Keith Grint, a great friend of the military, um, his superb works on leadership, command and management are well-thumbed books and documents um, on many of our bookshelves um, all around the army. So, uh, Professor Grint, um, over to you. So, uh, leading remotely on D-Day, uh, the fox and the hedgehog. So, I want to start with a quote from our killer cost. This is just a single piece, a single line of poetry. Uh, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Uh, no one is absolutely certain what this actually means, but I'm going to take 
Isaiah Berlin's argument about what this means. He says, hedgehogs relate everything to a single vision, central vision, one system, a single universal organizing principle. Foxes, in contrast, pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory, connected, if at all, only in some de facto way. Hedgehogs lead lives, perform acts, and entertain ideas that are centrifugal rather than centripetal. Fox's thought is scattered or diffused, moving on many levels, seizing upon a vast variety of experiences. So I want to use that as a framework for thinking about uh, how D-Day played out. So hedgehogs are one-trick ponies. They have a short tail, which denotes their single focus or a lack of balance, depending on which way you understand this. And for geographical and cultural reasons, uh, Germany develops a cult of combat, a battle-focused hedgehog. It's really good at battles because it's good at one thing. Foxes, on the other hand, are jacks of all trades, but masters of none. They have a very long tail, which denotes balance, but they're not as single-minded. And for cultural reasons, the Western allies develop a formidable logistics machine, a war-focused fox. So what might this imply for organizations and what might leading remotely on D-Day tell us about getting the balance wrong? Well, let's just start with the beginning or as they say on Homeland, previously on Homeland. So remote decision-making is a long history. Uh, <clears throat> this is a fragment uh, from a letter found in Vindolanda, which is a Roman uh, fort in the north of England about 2000 years ago. Uh, and for those of you who don't speak Latin or don't read this, uh, this is what it actually says. I have sent you a certain number of pairs of socks from Satua, that's in Gaul, two pairs of sandals and two pairs of underpants. So remotely leading things, there's not nothing novel. It's uh, always been like this, it's always been difficult. And maybe we should turn to the Jesuits as a way of thinking about how difficult it would have been to, re to, uh, to lead very remotely. Uh, so if you were working as a Jesuit priest in Japan, for example, it would take you about two years to get a letter back. So a year to get to Rome and a year to get back from Rome. Uh, so the notion of controlling remotely is, is virtually disappeared. And, and the consequence was what the Jesuits actually did is put a huge amount of focus on selection and training. So they made sure they got the right people in post because you were not able to control them from such a great distance. So it was worth reversing the assumptions of titles. So what does leading non-remotely mean? Does it mean leading in person or within sight or if not physical touching distance? Uh, so what we have in these two images below are examples of naval leadership, which combine both remote and proximate leadership. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, Admiral Nelson uh, conducting conversation with his uh, captains just before the Battle of Trafalgar. So here you have this approximate leadership. But on the right hand side, you have the battle plan for the Battle of Trafalgar. And if you know anything about the Battle of Trafalgar, you will know that by and large, once the battle starts, the idea is that you don't have much remote control over what's going on. Uh, the plan is for everybody to engage on their individual ships. There is very little remote control once the battle starts. So remote leading implies an alternative exists. It implies Leading uh, approximately might be an alternative and the choice is binary, either you lead remotely or you lead approximately. I'm not sure this is the case. A conventional hierarchy attempts to solve this binary dilemma by considering the alternatives not as remote or proximate, but as centralized or decentralized, and it opts for the former. Thus hierarchies offer control that is both distant and proximate because the red thread, the tight reins of control, run all the way from the top to the bottom. However, hierarchies are notoriously inflexible and unresponsive to change. The top cannot always know the circumstances facing the bottom and therefore cannot, and indeed should not, always directly control the bottom. So we think about the German hedgehog, which I'm going to suggest is actually a culture of combat. So the origins of the German hedgehog lie in the Prussian army under Frederick the Great, so the most successful European army at the time, and it's rooted very much in very tight reins, very much direct control. Uh, it's very disciplined and the speed of action is rooted in uh, extensive drill and fear of your own side, never mind fear of the enemy. 
led allegedly by an individual genius. The officers were chivalrous nobles and the soldiers were merely walking muskets. They just did what they were told. Now that works quite well until <clears throat> the French decide not to play by those rules at the Battle of Jena and Auerstadt in 1806. <clears throat> they undermine what the Prussians are trying to do and Napoleon's levy en masse, the kind of indisciplined swarm as it's sometimes called, uh, doesn't seem to be fighting on the same, the same system, the same mechanical system. It's fighting independently and it's remotely controlled at the level of the corps, led by officers selected on merit, all in the so-called noble cause of European republicanism. And the Prussian reins are just too tight for this. They're too inflexible. So that leaves them with a problem. So how do you respond to this different kind of warfare? Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing many of you will know that von Moltke the Elder is involved uh, very heavily in this, the chief of the general staff of the Prussian army. And the two options facing him and the Prussians are option one, war is actually linear. So you need proximate leadership. You need even tighter reins than you previously had. So the reason we lost the war against the French is because the reins weren't tight enough. And option two is actually no, war is non-linear. Uh, what you absolutely need is remote leadership. You need looser reins, not tighter reins. So the origins of mission commander, Auftrags tactic, as the Germans would call it, the so-called uh, centralized intention, <clears throat> but loose reins, are commonly fixed out on this line. You can see the difference between the alignment. So close alignment, you do exactly as I tell you, and autonomy, you do whatever you want. So the original star for the Prussian army is based very much towards the alignment end. So one option is to go to the other end of this alignment autonomy. So you basically say, well, since we can't control you from the center, we guess you just have to do what you do on the field. But actually that's not what happens. What happens is this, they reframe the problem. So it's not a question of, do you align closely or do you allow lots of autonomy, but you have both. So the whole point of mission command is that Everybody knows what their mission is, but how they achieve their mission is basically down to them. So you can have high alignment and high autonomy at the same time. And this becomes a framework, an ideological framework for uh, much of the German army uh, later, as we'll see. It's also worth thinking about how this, this shift in compliance is not just limited to the military in the 19th century. It's always an error to assume that the military is separate from what's going on in society. And maybe the best way of, of understanding this link is to think about some of Foucault's work, a French philosopher, who talked about the shift uh, between the middle of the 18th century and the middle of the 19th century, from punishing the body to self-disciplining the mind. So a shift in some senses from torturing people to control uh, to the panopticon. So the top left, you have a conventional uh, issue, an example, an illustration of torture. This is how you control people. If they don't do as you tell them, you torture them. And on the right hand side, you have an image of the panopticon. This is Jeremy Bentham's plan, uh, never actually realized for a prison, originally designed for factories, but then uh, he designed a prison as well. <clears throat> and the idea behind the panopticon is that you'd have a central single pillar uh, with one prison officer in, uh, and the prisoners would be in their single cells and the prisoners would never know whether they were being watched or not by the single central prison officer. And because you never knew whether you were being watched, you would self-discipline. So this is about leading remotely in many ways that you don't need to control people because they're controlling themselves. And in some way, this is one of the basic frames for mission command. So mission command is perhaps best illustrated <clears throat> and in terms of its utility and the problems that are generated by it in March, 1918 in the First World War. So this is a German breakthrough, the so-called spring offensive, which is not rooted in technology, but in mission command. So they shift away from the long disciplined lines of troops walking towards the other side who carefully mow them down. They're shifting from that to the use of a Stoichtruppen or shock troops. These are small elite decentralized units of about eight armed soldiers led by NCOs and German officers. <clears throat> and they're basically taking the initiative as they go. So they're not long disciplined lines. Uh, they know what they have to do, but how they have to do it is now up to them. This is, um, the greatest advance since 1914 is achieved by this, uh, but there are 40,000 German casualties on day one and by day 15, the advance peters out. And by that time, they have captured 40 miles of territory and 75,000 British troops, but they've, uh, and there are also 180,000 British casualties, but the Germans have suffered 250,000 casualties. So it's a great advance. So 
why doesn't the spring offensive win the war? And the answer, I think, is partly because the German troops were inadequately supported in terms of logistics and strategic planning from the center. This is what I would call weak management. So they have poor remote control. This is not something which is just limited to the First World War. This is something which has plagued the Germans in the Second World War <clears throat> once we get past 1940. So Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, the Germans only take 10 weeks of supplies. They're all summer supplies. They assume that their combat skills are so great and the Soviet army is so useless that they will be over in 10 weeks. But it's not even clear what the strategy is in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Are they trying to destroy the Soviet Union? Are they trying to take territory? Are they trying to colonize the East? It's not absolutely clear. And of course, what happens in um, Operation Barbarossa is what happens in the end of the spring offensive. The short-tailed hedgehog runs out of steam. So what this cult of combat does is generate very efficient combat soldiers. This is a quote from uh, Trevor Dupuy, the American, who suggested, quote, on a man-for-man -man basis, the German ground soldier consistently inflicted casualties at about a 50% higher rate than they incurred from the opposing British and American troops under all circumstances. This was true when they were attacking and when they were defending, when they had a local numerical superiority and when, as was usually the case, they were outnumbered, when they had air superiority and when they did not, when they won and when they lost. And again, generally, the German high commanders rarely or never reproached their subordinates unless they made a terrible blunder. This way, went down to the individual soldier who was praised for developing initiative. This is not the kind of quote you would see when people were describing what either the Americans or the British forces were doing. The notion that you would develop initiative at a very low level is uh, completely alien to most British and American forces at this point in time. But the German mission command, ironically, also fails on D-Day. Uh, this is D-Day's dilemma for the Germans, and it's perhaps summarized nicely in the, the two pictures in the center at the top, the hard shell or the soft shell response. So a hard shell response is based upon an exogenous skeleton, the assumption that to prevent damage to your organization, whatever that is, you need to surround it with perfect processes, an impregnable system, as the crab does, very tough armor. The problem, of course, is when the armor is broken, then the whole thing shatters. The soft shell response on the right hand side is based on the assumption, you know, no matter how good your processes are, no matter how good your defenses are, there will always be a problem and something will always go wrong. So the issue is not how do you prevent damage, sorry, how do you, sorry, the issue is how do you prevent damage, the issue is actually how do you repair the damage when it inevitably occurs. And for the Germans, their dilemma is should they focus on the hard shell, so focus on the Atlantic wall to prevent the landings on D-Day, the first line of defense, this is one of the Rommel's arguments is that you shouldn't allow a breach. If you allow a breach, then everything is gone. Or the soft shell response. And actually, you can't stop the landing. The landing is just, the area is too great. You can't stop the landing. What you can do and what you must do is defend in depth and keep the armored reserve close enough to be able to respond when you know where the landing is. So there's a fatal compromise for the Germans at the top. There's no overall German command, so when Rundstedt has got no authority over Luftwaffe or the Navy, Rommel is working under Rundstedt but acting independently. Von Geer controls the main tank reserves but is independent of Rommel, and only Hitler can authorize the movement of the reserves. So Rommel's hard shell isn't hard enough, and von Rundstedt's soft shell is too bureaucratic to work. So the great military advantage that the Germans have early in the war, mission command, absolutely fails on D-Day at this aspect. The cult of combat also generates the weakness of this short tail. It requires more than proximate control to be sustainable. So for example, the German tanks are immobilized because they've got no fuel left. There's almost no tank training in Normandy in 1944. Uh, German fighters are towed onto runways by cows to save the fuel because they don't have any fuel. Uh, Luftwaffe ran out of pilots because their supply couldn't cope with the losses. But the question is, is having the best combat army sufficient to win the war? And I think the answer is probably no. So for example, the Battle of Kursk in 1943, the biggest uh, tank battle at the time, and about 350 armored fighting vehicles are, are lost, but that's for the, to the German side, but that's only less than 3% of the total production. So basically it's nothing. 
In the Battle of Alamein in October 1942, the Germans will lose about 200 armored fighting vehicles. That's less than 2%. Again, it's nothing. And even armored fighting vehicles as a total percentage of the munitions is virtually nothing. It's 7%. And the, the, the US is 5%. Now, when we look at the Allies, <clears throat> we have a different way of thinking through this problem. So the problem for the Allies is, is actually not the battle. The problem is the war. And they have a combat philosophy which is quite different, which is about overwhelming the enemy through materiel and technology, a focus on natural resources, and actually focus on logistics. This is the really issue, a really important issue for them. So perhaps it isn't the battlefields that did for the Germans or the Japanese, it's actually what O'Brien calls the super battlefield, so control over the air or the sea. And something like two thirds of all major combatants' budgets went into aircraft. So both the UK and the USA outproduce German aircraft industry. The US builds about 300,000 planes, mass scale, and there's no real danger of any air attack. So something like a quarter of German aircraft never actually reached the battlefield via the strategic bombing campaign. But they never ran out of aircraft. They ran out of pilots and they ran out of fuel. You can see how the pilot problem is um, represented in here. So the losses in May 1944 to the Luftwaffe are 2,000 pilot deaths. That's twice the numbers of pilots in terms of the replacement system. And between uh, January and May 1944, there's almost 100% turnover. So the monthly losses uh, between January and June are over 2,000, and the pilot deaths are about the same. So the Allied Air Force deaths are about 1,000, about half the Germans. And the replacement system is twice that. So as this war continues, it's basically a system of attrition and the Germans cannot win this. So in D-Day, the Luftwaffe promised to have a thousand aircraft, a thousand fighters in the air for the invasion, but it actually only has 319 aircraft and only of those only 172 are fighters. The Allies have got 11,000 aircraft and of those half of them are fighters. It's the same in tank production. Between 1939 and 1945, you can just, it's just crude figures here, the Allies tank production versus the German tank production, they are simply outproduced. <clears throat> this is about the management of war. This is not about combat and battle. And you can see it in the Allies' long tail. So about 10,000 of 17,000 troops in the US mechanized division were engaged either directly as mechanics or indirectly as tank crew responsible for tank performance on maintenance. For a British infantry division, about 15,500 soldiers at that time, about 20,000 people were servicing them. And of the 15 and a half thousand, only about 4,000 actually carried a rifle. So the service to combat ratio in the British Infantry Division is about nine to one. In the US Pacific <coughs> divisions, towards the end of the war, that combat ratio is about 18 to one. So there are 18 people servicing the one person who's engaged directly in combat. But the German service to combat ratio is two to one. Now they they focus almost completely on combat, but they don't focus on what allows the combat to continue. And when you look at the logistics, uh, you can see how this operates. So th the big problem for the allies is how they can get uh, an organization the size of Birmingham uh, from Dover to Berlin under attack all the time. And they do it and ensure that ally the allies never actually run out of fuel. Uh, they do it through this Pluto problem. Uh, project. So pipelines under the ocean, loads and loads of pipelines, and they need them because they're using about a million gallons of fuel every day. So the Allied Fox works on British and Canadian beaching, uh, and the German defense on Utah is minimal, so that works okay, but the US Fox nearly fails on Omaha. So 0915 on the first day, Bradley, seeing the chaos on Omaha, asked permission to withdraw the troops and land them somewhere else, somewhere towards a British beach. But the message never actually gets to London until the afternoon and by which time it's too late. And at 11 o'clock, uh, the Germans report that the Omaha attack has been repulsed. So Gen General Crace, the commanding officer of the 352nd Division, sends his reserve troops to blunt the British attack, not uh, the uh, German attack at Omaha. So one reason it also nearly failed is because it's focused, the, the Americans and the British focus on rank limited proximate leadership. So they're training for war management, not for combat leadership. And what you generate through this is really omnipotent leaders and impotent followers. And this is a picture from uh, underneath the Colville cliffs. And you can see the troops here standing around doing nothing. They were, they were there for about an hour. Uh, these are from the fourth division. Uh, and they had been trained to take a particular um, objective on a particular beach. And they were told if we 
if we get to the wrong part of the beach, we'll tell you what to do when we get there. Well, they got to the wrong part of the beach and everybody who knows what's going on is dead. So what you generate through this omnipotent leadership, rank limited leadership is impotent followers. At the top picture, you can see the, the image uh, on the first person off this landing craft is the officer. He has a vertical stripe on his helmet. Uh, this tells you who's in charge. Uh, this is useful for the enemy. Uh, and you can see how useful it becomes because the picture at the bottom is a week later and the vertical stripe for the officer has moved to the back of the helmet, not the front of the helmet. So on Omaha, ironically, the German hedgehog is eaten by the Allied fox because the Americans steal mission command from the Germans. And they, they do it in two ways. One, you know, because the amphibious tanks have failed and the armored funnies don't exist, it's the destroyer captains off Omaha who move in and start to uh, disrupt the German response. It's also the case that the beach commanders take control over a situation which is rapidly getting out of control. And the other aspect of this is that the German defenders run out of ammunition. So this is an issue that normally you would not expect this to happen, but because you've got this long screwdriver which suddenly appears or appears towards the end of the Second World War, the, um, the notion of logistics is way down the list. So as surely as the Allied German army commanders led their troops up close and personal to success, supported by the logistical success of remote senior leaders and mission command of US destroyer captains, the senior German leaders led their troops to defeat. So hedgehogs are good for battle fighting and they need proximate leadership, but effective war fighting requires a fox, distant and proximate leadership. Hedgehogs might be cuter than foxes, but they don't eat foxes. Thank you. Good to finish, uh, for good. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for a really uh, useful historical uh, historical context. Um, we are now moving on um, to General Nick Borden, um, who is a highly experienced officer in uh, dispersed leadership, having commanded 16 Air Assault Brigade. Uh, and then commanded the 3rd UK Division, including on, I think, three joint warfighter war exercises in America, uh, a huge exercise, uh, massively dispersed, dispersed force elements, and I know he will touch on those. Um, and he's now as Chief of Staff Operations in the Permanent Joint Headquarters, is, has oversight of UK deployments um, all around the globe. So again, experiencing uh, that wider uh, remote leadership uh, experience. Uh, General Nick, um, over to you. Uh, CGS generals, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, as Bill says, I've been asked to talk about my recent experiences of commanding the UK's Warfighting Division, 3rd United Kingdom Division, in the context of dispersal and remote leadership, obviously the, the issue of the day. Um, and as Bill says, many of these experiences um, I found useful now in my current job as Chief of Staff for the Permanent Joint Headquarters, the UK Joint Headquarters, particularly during the current pandemic. And much of my experience was learned in the very hard school of the US warfighter exercise, um, which Bill alluded to, which is the US Army's core and divisional exercise conducted in exceptionally lifelike simulated battlefield tests. And it is a truly searing professional experience, utterly relentless, unforgiving, and a bit like doing three back-to-back -back UK cast exercises on steroids. And we were lucky um, during my tenure, in fact, to get two consecutive shots at it with a year in between to train very hard in order to apply the harsh lessons that we'd learned. And dispersal was almost the first lesson we learned. Uh, physical dispersal, of course, directly relates to your survivability on the battlefield, linger for more than a few moments as an armoured mass or a headquarters, and a UAV will appear overhead and promptly followed by a BM-21 barrage with devastating effect. And we saw exactly this lesson played out during uh, the recent Nagorno-Karabakh conflict um, for real. You can't just move dispersed and then concentrate to fight. You've got to move dispersed and win the deep battle dispersed before you then concentrate for final effect. And that really is the essence of modern divisional combat. Dispersal uh, is also driven by the scale of the terrain that a modern division has to fight over, now measured in hundreds of kilometers rather than tens of kilometers uh, compared to its pro, uh, Cold War predecessor. And also by the dramatic digitization of enemy and friendly capability. 
which makes dispersal possible and also a necessity. And potentially by the CBRN threat, the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threat um, ever present uh, on the super battlefield. The threat of cyber and electronic warfare also requires virtual and digital dispersal, dispersal uh, as well as the physical. And crucially important, you've got to have a fail safe reversionary method when that all goes wrong. So for these reasons, we found ourselves dispersing our forces and our headquarters across vast distances and even across continents. The dispersal forced us to adapt in three particular ways. Firstly, the way we exploited and relied on enhanced digital communications and command information systems, um, clearly essential and what we're all learning uh, now as we get through the current situation. And I know Tom Coppinger Sims will no doubt talk more about that later on this morning. Secondly, in the way that we structured and located our various headquarters, and finally, the mindset and ethos of our way of command. Structure. Our first exercise drove a dramatic rethink in the way that we organized and located our headquarters. And pinching an idea that we'd seen used elsewhere, the army resourced us with a fully equipped divisional operations building back in the UK that allowed us to leave staff behind eventually back in this headquarters to work on reach back. And that minimized our footprint forward in the combat zone, essentially the battlefield version of working from home. Forward on the exercise area in the US, we moved away from a single huge divisional headquarters of old and moved to a series of smaller, modular, self-contained headquarters, rear area command post, a divisional information maneuver group, and two smaller interchangeable divisional command posts, and of course attack. And all of this gave us a much more survivable, separated and interchangeable command network. And it completely changed the way that I excised command. Mindset and ethos, arguably the most important part. Um, I quickly learned that the scale, complexity and intricacy of the modern divisional fight was simply too great for one person to digest in totality, or certainly too great for somebody of my modest abilities. And therefore, a sort of traditional Monty-like approach to command with a commander at the center and master of all he surveys just didn't survive contact. The modern fight requires a much more fluid and collegiate approach, um, which has been described as collective command, uh, most recently by Ant King in his book on divisional command. And it relies much more heavily on the expertise, advice, and the additional decision power of those around you. And your job as a commander is to take the best of what's offered by those around you, make it your own, and then put your stamp on it so that you can execute it together, but with command authority. Um, I have to say that having grown up um, all my life in a Scottish infantry battalion, this style of command came very naturally to me. And those of you um, who have had the privilege of serving with jocks before know that they can be an argumentative and contrary lot who aren't backwards in coming forwards. So I grew up quite used to having my orders discussed and debated by my soldiers in that unique tribal version of C2 that we've always enjoyed in the Scots. So trusted deputies are key to this more collective and dispersed command style. And I was extremely well served with a highly talented team of a US deputy an artillery and ISR commanders, and of course, a chief of staff. Although I might point out that the night battle watch in the headquarters was run by a young major. Importantly, it's not just their advice which matters, but the clear delegation of decisions to them. And in my absence, there were really almost no decisions that I wasn't comfortable with my deputy or artillery commander or even my chief of staff taking on my behalf. Now, critically, th this is much more than empowerment or mission command, which really means letting your subordinates get on with their jobs. It's collective command because you're asking them to help you do your job. A very few key decisions must always lie with a commander, as CGS said earlier. But how you get to that point as a team is the key. Now, achieving this requires preparation and trust and the clear articulation of the plan and your intent before the battle is joined. The staff must be comfortable and used to operating dispersed and with minimal direction. 
and they've got to be able to rely on good standard operating procedures, SOPs, but as a handrail to speed, not as a break on initiative. And we were fortunate to have a single team for the whole two years of our training progression um, and a, a bunch of one stars and brigade commanders that I'd known extremely well for many years. But I also made a point of going to the US and establishing a relationship with my fellow US commanders and the core commander before the exercises began, which proved to be enormously valuable. Staff tools to support rapidity of action and seizing the, of the initiative are key. Many of these are not new, but they need to be re-energized and brought back into the bloodstream. Commander's visualization of the battlefield, decision point tactics, virtual battle updates, top-notch LOs, absolutely critical, and extremely simple pictorial fragos to speed the dissemination of orders. And I have to tell you that the quality of staff uh, that I enjoyed in 3DIV and that we have in the British Army are more than up for this challenge. Some other thoughts now. Uh, you have to find a way on the dispersed battlefield to replicate the personal touch of the commander with his troops. Now that's easier with battlefield circulation forward and as Slim said, nothing cheers the troops up more than the sight of a dead general. But it's harder with the various headquarters staffs to the rear. So you have to establish what Richard Holmes called the bonds of mateship before the battle and ideally before the war. And then how you impose your will on your command in moments of crisis also needs thinking about. And a calm voice on the net, and that could be the internet or the radio net, um, still works wonders and certainly something we resorted to um, in extremis. Mistakes. The ability to make mistakes and learn from them is absolutely critical to this way of warfare. And I once had the privilege of hosting um, a chief of army staff of the Pakistan army uh, when he visited the UK, hugely impressive officer. And I thought as we were chatting that I would ask him as an ex-corps commander, uh, what single piece of advice he would give me as a new divisional commander. And he replied, always punish negligence, never punish mistakes. We must never allow a blame culture or a zero tolerance culture to stifle our people's initiative or appetite for risk taking. I return to command climate because it's so key to success in this dispersed modern fight and it's essential to embracing collective command. Your people um, need to get to know you well enough to challenge you if they're going to add value. So commanding remotely mustn't mean being a remote commander. So never bite people's heads off, however offbeat the solution. And don't rush as a commander to always tell them the right solution. Hold your tongue and see what they come up with. And even if it's mostly right or good enough, then that's probably better than your own imposed solution. Have the confidence to be proved wrong in public. You're the commander because you're the most experienced soldier there. So you probably will be right enough of the time in order to maintain your professional authority. You don't have to be right all of the time. And you don't have to stand that hard as a general in order to make an impact. I think modern commanders now should, should probably avoid saying what I want to happen is, and instead try saying, what do you think we should do about this? Finally, rest um, is absolutely key to successful command. And I was lucky to have a superb team uh, that I could rely upon. And we were all rigorously disciplined about sleeping um, during the long campaigns. And my chief staff um, used to say to me, sir, we only need you to make a handful of big decisions. So go and get some sleep so you're fit to make them when that moment comes. So I did. And as a result, our final after action review, which was conducted by um, General David McKinnon uh, of great repute, um, recorded that three UK Div finished the exercise almost as fresh and energized as we started it, while many others um, were exhausted by day three. And, and we've all seen that before on exercises and operations. So interesting, I think there's a real lesson there for dispersed working as well in the current climate. And it's one that I watch very carefully in PGHQ as we navigate um, running global operations during a COVID pandemic. 
So I'll draw to a conclusion there um, with three final points. Firstly, only concentrate when it's physically safe to do so, but establish the bonds and relationships before the battle is joined. Secondly, trust your instincts, especially when your instincts are that somebody else has got a better idea. And finally, foster a collective command culture because people have amazing capacity if only you let them have their head. I'll draw to a close there. Bill, back to you. John, thank you, uh, thank you very much for a really fascinating talk. You'll be, uh, you'll be pleased to know the questions have been rolling in. Uh, parallels drawn with crew resource management, follow a ship, um, and uh, a host of questions uh, about allowing uh, mistakes uh, and the challenge culture and how you foster that. So we'll return to those themes as we go through the panels. Uh, next up, we have uh, General Tom uh, Cobbinger Sims on remote uh, leadership in a whole force environment. Um, a rifleman by background, General Tom, has been dragged into the digital world over the last few years, uh, firstly in leading the Army's information maneuver uh, development as commander of the 6th Division, and now as director of strategy and military digitization. He's charged with accelerating defense's digital transformation. Uh, General Tom, over to you. Thanks, Bill. See yes, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for the chance to speak today and some really glittering company, I have to say. Um, so I've been asked to talk about remote leadership, particularly of whole force teams. Actually, Bill, I'll just check that you can hear me before I go on. Yeah, we've got you, John Tom. All Great, you. thanks. Um, I'll talk about remote leadership of whole force teams, and I think by, by implication, not on the front line, but I'll allude to it. Um, and of course, by whole force, for, for those who aren't familiar with that phrase, we mean the full mix of the three services, both re reserves and regulars, uh, civil servants, and um, importantly, our industry partners. So I hope I'm gonna discuss some of the opportunities and threats of remote leadership, uh, and offer some thoughts on the trade craft that we might wanna to develop to do that more effectively, particularly across a team that hasn't all been to Catterick or Perbright or Brecon or Sandhurst, nor, the, nor one that's done its forming, storming and norming on sort of replaying in Kenya or Canada. Now to do that, I'm gonna draw on some very non-scientific polling that I did on Twitter over the weekend. And many thanks to those of you in the audience who participated. Um, I've also been doing a bit of personal study recently into the appropriate use of data and statistics. And I'm very conscious that the military Twitterati are not necessarily a fully representative group. But nevertheless, they flew up some very useful insights about remote working in general and the whole force implications in, in particular. So I'll draw on them as we go through. Uh, and for those of you who are really interested, it's probably worth reading the whole thread because it did throw up an awful lot of information I won't be able to share today. I'm also going to kick off with some other uh, unscientific research by someone else on Twitter who had asked how many days folk would like to work remotely in a post-lockdown world. Now, as I mentioned, there's lots of reasons to suggest that Twitter users aren't a perfect representation of the wider population. But nevertheless, the 25,000 responses to that question might, in any case, be regarded as statistically significant. So of those 25,000 people who responded to the question, only 4% said they wanted to be back in the office full time. 5% wanted one day a week away from the office. 22% wanted at least two days, 36, three days away, and a full third, 33%, said they wanted to move to working remotely full time. So whatever margin of error you apply, I think we can work on the assumption that remote working to one extent or another is here to say, most likely in some form of hybrid uh, arrangement. Now, one of the soapboxes I've stood on over the past year is reminding people, particularly in head office, about the fact the great majority of defences people, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and a large number of civil servants, particularly in organisations such as the field army, do not routinely work in offices. Or at least if they do, their office is a ship, a tank, a plane, a workshop, a deployed headquarters, or indeed a front gate. And in my current role, I'm particularly keen, we broaden the prevailing discussion about new ways of working to consider how we make all of Defence's workforce more productive and more enriched with data-driven technology, and not just those of us who routinely polish an office chair. 
So I hope what I say is, is largely applicable across defence and not just office workers, but it will be rooted in, in some of the office environment. So the first thing I'm going to say, and this will absolutely echo uh, General Nick, remote leadership should be a very normal thing for those of us in uniform, particularly in army uniforms. Good soldiers operate and fight as remotely as possible if they want to stay alive. And I'm probably not the only one in the audience today who had spacing drilled into them by their cadet force instructor as a teenager, their corporal at phase two depot, or their color sergeant at Sandhurst. And of course, much of the history of the development of command and control, as the professor took us through, was about expanding the reach that a commander can achieve on the battlefield so that we can increase our dispersion, whether that was by voice, by an ADC on horseback, by the telegraph, the radio, the email, or indeed Speckle Jim, the carrier pigeon, for those of you who remember him. So to echo what much of what General Nick Borton has spoken about, every operation I've been on has been very significantly dispersed. Uh, Brigadier Bill and I uh, served in Northern Ireland at the same time, whereas a multiple commander, a half platoon, in a border post, you might have spent a, a couple of weeks, um, probably three weeks, in a deployment in effectively a submarine, where at best or worst, depending on your viewpoint, you might have seen your company commander once or twice in that period. In Kosovo and Bosnia, the multinational divisions had huge spans of command, and particularly at company level, there was extreme autonomy. As an SO2, I flew all over the world causing trouble, armed only with a pretty ropey Nokia at the time. In Basra on Telic 10, we were very much on top of each other in the palace, but with a very isolated outpost at the, J, uh, the Joint Coordination Center. And of course, as a battle group, we were properly cut, up, cut off from the rest of the task group in the COB. And obviously in, in Nari Siraj and beyond, you know, I'd, I'd see my company commanders at best once every other week as I did my tours around the AO. As a brigade and divisional commander, I had a huge span of command, you know, 19 units in one hour side brigade as we stood it up. So this is nothing new. And I dearly hope that our junior commanders on Op Newcomb are experiencing the same levels of independence and autonomy over stretched and fragile lines of communication with all the freedom of respons responsibility it brings. And particularly to echo some previous comments, the resilience and the camaraderie that it builds. So leading teams remotely should be in our DNA. The fact we're now commanding remotely in the home base, as well as on operations, is just another aspect of the increasingly blurred distinction between war and peace and between home and away. So right up front, I'd reiterate the, the point already made that this is exactly why mission command is our command philosophy. It's evolved to overcome challenges of time and space by establishing not how to carry out a given mission, but what needs to be achieved and why, with a subordinate free to execute as she sees fit, underpinned by the mutual trust and common understanding that enables such an approach. But clearly my specific task today is to consider what this means, not for a bunch of soldiers, but for a much more diverse and varied group, for a whole force team of regulars and reserves, of civil servants and industry, and even some of those strange folk known as sailors and airmen. So the first opportunity that strikes me is very obvious and will be raised again and again today, but is too important to skip over. Mission Command is our philosophy exactly because it allows teams to work within a clearly expressed overall intent, but with the freedom to deliver their part flexibly, with latitude to seize fleeting opportunities in changed circumstances, especially when they can't speak to the boss. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, whilst this may be prevalent on operations, and we should continually check that as an assumption, we have often struggled to embed mission command when we come home from operations in our larger institutional headquarters and the enabling organizations of defense. So in the spirit of never wasting a good crisis, this is an opportunity we must seize. To be clear, I am not advocating that we issue primers on mission command to our civil service colleagues or industry partners, but embedding its tenets across the whole of the defense enterprise would be a huge win. So what might we call this approach when not deployed, when it's deployed into the whole force environment? Well, to be honest, I'm not that fussed. It's the principles that matter more than the name we give it. And we should not assume that we will be sharing some kind of military secret. 
What I've learned working with digital folk in a very heavily civilian environment is that agile delivery, by which I mean the approach adopted by a large proportion of software teams, is a very close match, not just to mission command, but our own attitude towards battle procedure. And we should be very wary of assuming that those of us in uniform have a monopoly on delegation to the point of discomfort or selfless commitment or servant leadership. And whilst empowerment may have become a slightly loaded word in defense now, to me, it does embody that front footedness and confidence to sense, decide and act that you see in all of the best teams and individuals, whatever clothes they wear. So that's what we're after. But I would advise that we're all humble when engaging our industry partners and civil service colleagues. You may find they are significantly more empowered than you are. So whatever we call it, mission command or agile or empowerment, there's a huge potential opportunity in remote working that we must seize to embed the underlying precepts of mission command across defense. Now, the other obvious opportunity that should come with remote working is the flexibility to put back some balance in the Adair triangle we were all taught about, that three-way split between the mission, the team, and the individual. Put differently, there's an opportunity to balance our split identities as soldiers and crown servants on the one hand, and as mothers, husbands, sons, and lovers on the other. Now, I know that lockdown doesn't feel like much of an opportunity for work-like balance at the moment. And I'm painfully aware that for many service people, the last year will have been a time of unprecedented levels of separation from loved ones and families. But for those of us working from home or living at work, which is probably more appropriate, it's been a helter-skelter year of RAM diaries with not even the transition between meeting rooms to grab a brew, stretch one's legs, or breathe some fresh air. I know that. And I know that for those of us who are parents, and let's face it, the burden is still falling egregiously heavily on mothers rather than fathers, even a five minute break between Zoom and Teams is immediately filled by demands for juice, biscuits, or iPad charges. Nevertheless, I think we can all see the potential and we must work out how to grasp it. So in spite of my workload, I have never seen so much of my kids and it's been fabulous. Who knew they were that noisy? Who knew they were that perpetually hungry? And who knew they learned quadratic equations that young these days? It's been lovely. And whilst I'm delighted the little beggars are back at school this week, I'm very clear there's a significant opportunity for us here if we can structure our future ways of working sensibly. So if embedding the mission command across the whole force and improving the balance in our lives are two opportunities, what are some of the threats? Well, I'm a 51 year old major general. I live in a nice house. I've got young kids who aren't studying for GCSE or A-levels. My wife's building a portfolio of net appointments rather than working full time. We got a puppy just before lockdown. I've got all the support I need and pretty much all of the IT and most of the bandwidth I need to work from home. I was already doing a fair bit of remote working before COVID and I've just dialed it up. When I need a secret VTC, I drive into army headquarters, which is 15 minutes away. Life is pretty good. That is simply not the case for many, many people across defense. And at a time when the ties that bind our teams together were already under stress, the remote working experience is another amplifier that exaggerates rather than minimizes our differences. I have members of my team who are just starting their careers, who were really excited to be living away from home to be starting on the career ladder, enjoying the bright lights of London at close range with money to spend. Now they find themselves captives in a small flat with rubbish connectivity and a large rent bill. They can't see their friends and they're working from dawn to dusk. Many of them have not met many of the team in the real world and they have minimal opportunity to learn the rules of the road or to learn the bizarre set of foreign languages that we speak across defense. Our Byzantine processes for everything from security clearances to being issued a laptop to our annual reporting are governed by policy documents that are carefully hidden around the internet and the intranet as if they were clues in an Easter egg hunt. For them, remote working feels really remote. It's lonely, it's confusing, and it really doesn't feel like all those years at school and university were quite so worth the effort. So that's a threat. The gap between the 50-something major general and the 20-something fast streamer is widening by the week. And closing it down across Skype 
is going to be a big challenge. So if that's a gap between different individuals' experience of remote working, what does it mean for us as teams? Well, I mentioned that every operation I'd been on involved remoteness and how comfortable we were in it. But of course, we'd trained and prepared for it for months on end. So for platoons and companies and battle groups, you should be thriving in this remoteness. But for a whole force team that hasn't had that luxury, and particularly for a new team, this is a real trial. So that's the threat I'd point to, is not for teams per se, it's for new teams. And as CGS said, in a time of perpetual and accelerating change, when we more than ever need to bring together new and increasingly diverse groups of skill sets and mindsets, that is a big problem and that is a big threat. It's the incumbents who will be relishing the freedoms that come with remote working at the moment. It's the new areas of defense, the challengers, who will be finding it really, really tough. Now, the third mention I'll brief, uh, the third threat I'll briefly mention, just because it is so critical and so relevant today. And it's the very real and present cyber threat. Now, as we adapt to these new ways of working, we need to be very clear that our threat surface is increasing. So whether it's the Siri or the Alexa in your drawing room, as you answer a classified call, or the vulnerabilities that we have until now failed to design out of our core technologies, or indeed the individual isolation and vulnerability that is manna for heaven for human operators, we need to be very conscious of the rising threats to our data, to our systems and our people. So I don't think those opportunities or threats will necessarily be news to anybody, but what can we do about them? Briefly, the Twitter poll I mentioned was pretty clear on the first thing, the need for conscious, persistent, and deliberate over communication, using multiple channels, little and often. By all means, change the metaphor, alter the examples, but keep the core messages the same if you want that mutual understanding and trust. It's comms 101. Until you are heartily sick of your own message, it hasn't even got close to breaking through. So communicate, communicate, communicate. But what are the tricks we can use to bind our teams together and build that mutual understanding through communication. Well, as you may be able to tell, I'm an extrovert, but I work with a very large number of introverts. And of course, we have thousands in defense, even if the popular thought is that we are all extroverted. I particularly work with comms engineers, software engineers, digital folk. And whilst it doesn't do to generalize, and I don't have the data to back it up, I'm prepared to bet that a fair, on a fair bit of money, that in a whole force team, it's the uniform members who are either through nature or nurture, more likely to be extroverted than our civil service colleagues. That has always led to an uneven balance in communication. We send more than we receive, and that is not good for teams. Well, so what? Well, I've noticed as we started meeting almost exclusively in the virtual world, that whereas some of my colleagues were very uncomfortable speaking up in a physical meeting, Many of those same people on Skype or Teams are very happy to comment in the IM and make their point quietly but effectively in written form. They've become used over years of wrestling with us uniform types, not to even bother contesting the airwaves. But virtual meetings give them a chance to, let's say, give them a set of subtitles that we can add into our meetings. That's been a huge improvement in two-way communication. And for the non-boomers, to get their voice heard. So that's my first point in pursuit of mission command empowerment and agile ways of working. We really need to think about these tools that we've got and how they can improve our working lives. How you find space for that two-way flow of communication that is so critical. It is merely a 21st century update to the military voice procedure that we all learned as kids. Enhancing the security, accuracy and brevity of communications but making sure that every call sign can get its critical information onto the net. Now that could be as simple as explaining how the IM is to be used or having somebody in your meeting who's looking out for IM. It could be telling people how to use the hand raise function or watching for that person who unblocks their microphone five times, but never actually speaks and you need to invite them in. And I would enjoin you as you do all this, think really carefully as well, not just how you run meetings online, 
but reflect on how good you were at it in the physical world, because we will go back to it. So I reflect on how inclusive or otherwise my orders groups were in the physical world, whether I was really creating an environment where the newest, almost junior person in the room really felt empowered to ask a question or challenge my assertions. So if the first trick of the trade is about mastering the simple communication tools we've got, the second one goes deeper into that theme. Geek up a bit. What doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Get curious about digital and cyber. They really are a thing. They aren't going away in either your professional or your personal lives. And your civilian and industry teammates will have very little respect for a leader who eschews technology, whether it's operational or informational. Having your emails printed for you might have given you combat credibility a decade ago. Now it marks you out for extinction. And as I mentioned, you and your data, and incidentally your families are under threat. Wise up, understand your digital environment, work out what the five and twenties that we learned in Iraq and Afghanistan to protect us from IEDs are. Work out what those five and twenties are in the digital environment. We are printing lots on this from Defence Digital at the moment. Read it, talk to your teams about it, talk to your families about it and protect yourselves. So those are two things. And very briefly um, on the last, this comes back to people and building teams. I can't be the only one who has actually had richer conversations on the back of Zoom calls than I had in the physical world. The guitar in the corner, the broken mug on the desk, the weird picture on the wall, it offers a new route to much richer conversations with all of our teammates, whether they're in the military or the civilian world or industry. Prioritize those conversations, find time for them. You know, when I was a young officer, it was Chelsea Football Club and a pack of silk cut or Marlboro lights. That broke the ice, usually with a stream of invective, but followed by a stream of human. Find those ways to prioritize the little moments before and after meetings where you can break through the professional gap into the personal life. And if you happen to be a military leader, try and make yourself human too. You might, you might be coming across as a stereotypical command, mask of command person who your whole force teammates find very difficult to relate to. And showing a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of humanity will go a long way. Bill, I'll shut up there, but uh, I hope that helps. Fantastic. Thank you for a, uh, a really engaging talk. Um, uh, lots of comments uh, coming in uh, on the back of that talk as well. Your themes about communication picking up a lot of traffic, and that will link perfectly into people like Chris Waddy's talk this afternoon about how we communicate um, in, uh, in a more remote uh, work environment. Lots of comments as well about what hybrid working looks like uh, and are we on it? We'll probably come back in, in, into the panel or out with this as well, but very topical both in the media uh, and internally. Um, and also comments about diversity, um, inclusion, flexibility, how in this new work environment, um, if you look at the office space, we balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the business in, in order to get the best from both and it being individuals and all individuals different uh, who are different which is a perfect segue um, into our next speaker, uh, Siobhan Sheridan, um, on the challenges of leading a dispersed workforce. Um, we're delighted to have uh, Siobhan with us uh, today. You are very welcome. Um, having gained a wealth of experience in the private and public and third sector, uh, Siobhan joined the Ministry of Defence in July uh, 2017 um, as Civilian HR Director, responsible for a civilian workforce of about 57,000 people. And she also represents um, the diversity and inclusion, or runs the diversity and inclusion strategy for defence. So a perfect segue into putting people at the centre of this whole process. Uh, so on over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome. I'm very glad to join you all today. It's a great opportunity to reflect, actually, as a leader, both of a team myself, but also um, a, a people leader, an HR leader more broadly in organisations. And I'm sure many of those of you on the line uh, have that sort of background also. So I've been asked to talk about the challenges of leading a dispersed workforce. And um, of course, we've all probably had many experiences of being a part of a dispersed workforce, whether it be from being the kind of the one person uh, who's not based in the same place as everybody else, um, uh, whether it's being a part of a, a multi-site 
globally dispersed team trying to kind of manage the complexities of time zones and time zone differences um, or in an organization like defense where um, as we said we've had 57,000 uh, civil service colleagues dispersed across the country across the globe um, deployed alongside um, our military colleagues um, and I don't pretend to be an expert academic in this field there are many of those uh, on the line today but what I am is a practitioner researcher somebody who's really interested in learning from experience um, and improving what I do and what we do in organizations um, as a result of that and I think the last few months um, have brought this subject into shock focus for us all um, an unwanted um, and very different kind of experiment uh, in being dispersed in a very different way um, that in defense and um, just about a year ago today led to us sending pretty much all of our civil service and um, colleagues uh, to work remotely um, and I think uh, that has given us an opportunity to reflect on um, how effectively we lead dispersed teams and I may be the only person um, on the line I don't think so though who's found myself wanting uh, in that respect as I reflect so the question that I've been asking myself is what kinds of qualities might be necessary for dispersed teams to truly flourish um, and when I say flourish I mean flourishing in terms of what we need to deliver in organizations but also flourishing as human beings um, and I think it's important that we reflect on this now because it's not yet clear um, whether as organizations we're going to spring back like the proverbial rubber band in operating in ways that we did previously we're already seeing examples like the Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon sharing his view that working from home is not a new normal um, but an aberration um, so over the course of the next few months as organizations we're going to be making critical decisions about how we decide to act and operate including decisions that will affect our ability to be able to attract the very best talent for the future and I think that means it's a good opportunity to reflect. So I'm going to share just five areas where I think um, uh, we have had things brought into really significant focus over the course of the last few months. The first of those has been referenced by many uh, colleagues on the line, and that is communication. The challenges of communicating to dispersed teams, and this was brought into sharp relief um, for us in defence when we uh, needed to seek to do that, including in environments where some of our defence colleagues didn't even have access um, to any defence technology. Fortunately, our defence communications colleagues had really well-practiced experience in getting messages across to very diverse teams. And as Tom's already mentioned, we really began to understand the criticality of context, keeping our messages simple, keeping them really clear, and making sure that we were repeating them and that we were clear about where ownership sat. Um, for the next steps, enabling local leaders in local environments to lead in the way that they saw best and empowering them to be able to do so. One of the things that did come into its own over this period of time, however, was our all staff dial-ins, which prior uh, to uh, uh, lockdown was a channel that maybe 100 people would dial into, it might take 10 minutes, uh, nobody had any questions and almost overnight um, mushroomed into a channel of 10,000 uh, at its height, colleagues dialing in um, to get their questions answered. Our permanent secretary Stephen, Chief of Defence Staff Nick Carter did an amazing job of answering hundreds of questions coming through multiple routes and it became a really powerful way I think of sensing what some of the key issues and concerns were were in a very dispersed organisation, sensing the ways in which our messages were or weren't landing. The second area I wanted to mention briefly was community. So community is something that I think we probably don't talk enough about in respect of the workplace. And I think we only really realised how much it mattered when it had disappeared. Now, interestingly, um, in the absence of the formal ways that we would go about building community, the people in my team, at any rate, who stepped into the breach um, were often the people who'd been most excluded by our London-centric um, tendencies as a team. So they were the people who were very used to needing to build community for themselves because the old ways of doing things really weren't making that happen for them. 
CJS mentioned resilience earlier on and just launched yesterday actually as a Chartered Institute for Cell and Development rapid evidence assessment of resilience, which demonstrates that one of the few strong predictors of resilience is indeed our relationships, our support from co-workers and managers, um, and as we'll talk about later, high quality leadership. So people began to look out for each other in many ways, um, coffee roulette, team calls, walks and talks, all sorts of ways of doing that, and some more innovative forms of leadership. So one example that I noticed was the Four Alpha Network, a network run by soldiers for soldiers, concentrating on alcohol awareness. And they really, really stepped up and um, their activity to support colleagues and their, their families at a moment in time where they recognised the risk that lockdown presented. And it made me wonder whether there's more that we can do um, in organisations to embrace employee activism, perhaps rather than see it um, sometimes as we do as a threat. The third area that I wanted to mention was collaboration. Now, Keith uh, mentioned that leading remotely is not, it, it's not new, it's not novel, um, and neither are the challenges that come with it. So many of our teams, I'm sure, who have worked remotely would say that collaboration has always um, been a problem. Um, an environment in which we tend to adopt very um, mothership, if I can use that terminology, centric approach approaches to collaboration um, based around an assumption of synchronous requirement, often based around a meeting format lacking um, creativity. And there's a fantastic example that happened right across Defence HQ actually, of a policy development group that came together to work on developing colleague support materials and resources. These are people who came from different backgrounds, from different um, uh, directorates, some of them were shielding alone, some of them uh, had um, caring responsibilities or children, um, and between them they managed to make their different working practices and experiences um, a real benefit, and they came together across that breadth of experience to work in asynchronous ways, sharing documents, working when they could, um, basing what they delivered on the back of their experience and expertise, not necessarily what their role or directorate defined. My dear friend and mentor, Professor Gareth Jones, used to say that structures and cultures kill leadership. And I think this was a great example of a moment in time where the absence um, of those more obvious structures and cultures enabled um, really true leadership to emerge. Um, and then uh, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about compassion. Um, uh, a word that probably isn't often used in organisations, and yet the single biggest piece of feedback in our most recent people survey. So our most recent people survey in defence demonstrated um, an increase of 4% in our overall engagement, um, and a total uh, which takes us to a total of 9% improvement over the course of the four years that defence has been led by our current permanent secretary and chief of defence staff. Um, now, while some of that could be contextual, our commentary analysis really, really indicates that the increases in our leadership managing change scores of something like 8% could be specifically related, related to compassionate leadership. Colleagues reported experiencing a different type of leadership. What do I mean by compassion? Um, compassion is about much more than sympathy. It's about being prepared to act to make things better for someone else. Colleagues reported experiencing um, uh, being able to talk more freely about inequalities that they had previously um, experienced. It's always been difficult to parent and work. It's always been difficult to homeschool and work. It's always been difficult um, to be um, a partnership of two military colleagues um, trying to manage um, respective responsibilities. But what happened over this period of time was our leaders opened up to having conversations about things that had previously been hard to discuss. And whether that was health challenges, caring responsibilities, mental health challenges, or indeed um, areas like domestic abuse. I saw so many examples of compassionate leadership um, across the organization that it would be difficult to name all of them. Um, moving quickly on, I do wanna say a word about challenge, which I think has risked going a little bit 
um, awry in this environment. I've seen some pretty bad examples um, of challenge often fueled by the way in which we're using virtual environments um, and, and also real careful attention being paid to how we create the right environment um, for challenge uh, in these sorts of virtual worlds. Colleagues need to feel as though their relationship is secure, that the environment is safe, it helps to be able to see the sorts of micro gestures that encourage us to continue the ability to choose the moment. And um, as we recommended in our Chilcot guide to challenge can be hampered somewhat in this virtual environment. So fundamentally, in this environment, leaders, I would suggest, need to become better at inviting and um, challenge. And Megan Wrights and John Higgins talk about this in their research on speaking truth to power as listening up. How do we as leaders de-risk um, the decision, take responsibility for ensuring that people know that challenge is appreciated and valued? And finally, I want to say a word about connection. At the end of the day, all of this, I feel, is underpinned by a genuine sense of connection between individuals, leaders, followers, colleagues, teammates. Leadership to me is fundamentally relational. I'm going to ask you for a second to bring to mind one of those not so good leaders that you've worked with. And I suspect, sadly, that might not take you too long. Um, I'd also suggest that perhaps that leader is someone who has maybe made you feel like a vessel through which they're getting their tasks delivered, um, rather than a human being um, contributing um, to the mission, uh, you know, whatever the activity is that you're delivering. Um, the Irish poet John O'Donoghue says that the greatest longing of the human soul is to be seen. Um, and I'd ask you again to bring to mind someone that you can think of who you have been led by, who's made you feel truly seen and truly seen in this environment, in this environment of virtual working and virtual operation. So just to finish off, I want to say a word about this kind of virtual environment, because I think the opportunity going forward is to consider the space um, that we're inhabiting at any given moment in time, rather than places um, in which work occurs. And um, the fantastic architect Christopher Alexander says that when organisations are housed in enormous undifferentiated buildings, people stop identifying with the people who work there as personalities and think only of the institution as an impersonal monolith staffed by personnel. In short, the more monolithic the building is, the more it prevents people from being personal and making human contact with the people that they work with. So perhaps for me, the opportunity as we go forward it is being able to strip away some of those monolithic buildings maybe that we've all operated in and to find ways to inhabit these new spaces and um, that we're operating going forward and finally i've mentioned professor gareth jones as i've worked my way through this presentation and as a tribute to gareth who sadly dies uh, in january i'd offer you perhaps the only question anyone in leadership i think needs to ask themselves on a regular basis uh, regardless of environment, why should anyone be led by you? Siobhan, fantastic. A, a really good end uh, to what was a brilliant talk. Again, it's generating huge amounts of questions. Um, John Sam, well, the first question um, is, is directed uh, to you, but we'll go uh, probably wider after that, uh, probably to Siobhan, I think, um, as well. And I'll link a couple of questions together. So it's a question from Heather Rendell, which says, um, in your book, Team of Teams, you state that the role of the senior leader was no longer that of a controlling puppet master, but rather that of an empathetic crafter of culture. To what extent do you think emotional intelligence should be used in annual reports or promotion boards? Before you answer that, so I'd just say one of the themes throughout this has been in, digitize, in the digitized world and leadership, is there a particular leadership quality that we should be nurturing? And without wishing to stack the odds, um, Anna Kimber has come up with a similar question um, and she would contend that collective command comes very naturally to women rather than more individual uh, command style. And how do we go about developing those qualities uh, within our leaders? 
So, General San, if I come to you first, and then I'll, uh, I'll come on to Siobhan. Sure, and I'll keep it short because the wisdom is really across this panel and in the group. Uh, I think that the critical thing we need for leaders today is self-discipline. And that may not be intuitive to everybody, but we can figure out the kind of leaders we need to be, that we need to empower people. But it takes a certain amount of self-discipline not to fall back into the habits that we saw, to want to be autocratic, to want to be in charge, because there's an expectation that we will be that person on horseback, the person with all the answers. And it takes a certain amount of self-control to say, no, I'm actually not the best decision maker for this, even though everybody in the moment might be looking for me. I've got to push it down and I've got to subordinate my ego. It was quite a journey for me to do that because I was afraid that I would lose my uh, legitimacy as a commander if I wasn't the iron fisted person in charge, but that just wouldn't work. And I found that I didn't lose my legitimacy if I listened more and pushed decision-making down. In fact, I found that people thought that was, a, seemed to think that was a better role. So I love that description of being a crafter of culture. Um, but I also think sometimes uh, culture can be quite a challenge to work with. And so, um, so the other thing that I kind of wonder about is, is, is our role in forming climate. Um, which I think is is much more kind of malleable. So, you know, um, uh, Rob Brinner quite often describes kind of climate as being a little bit like our mood and culture as being like our personality. And our mood is, if you ask my husband, he'd definitely say my mood is much more malleable to change than my personality. So, um, so I'd offer that kind of distinction in. And then in terms of leadership quality, um, the one that I would most like to see um, honed is that of curiosity. I think if we can be truly curious um, about other human beings, about the environments that we're operating in, then that is the access point to a whole host of other things. Siobhan, thank you. That, that links really nicely to, um, to a subsequent question, uh, which has been focused in the workplace now. Um, and I'm afraid I, I can't get all the names of, of the people the questions have come from, but the, all the work we put into, all the lessons we've learned over the last year with COVID enforced remote working and, and the benefits, the few good things that have come out of it. I know a particular concern is come end of June, whenever it happens to be on our roadmap and we can come back into the workplace. And you see it in discussions in the media and, and commerce as well. And uh, I know from our survey, 57% of the army headquarters think the biggest barrier is military culture. And they're expecting everybody to be called back, called back in again and back to the old ways. How do we stop that, both in the military and, and in the commercial sector? I think I'll come to all the panelists you want, but if I start with you. I think if we can, if we can actually spend a little bit of time reflecting on what it is that we've learned um, from this period of time, what are the benefits um, that we've derived? And, and I genuinely think that some of those benefits and learnings are critical to us being able to access the skills and capabilities of the talent that we need for the future. Jill Tom. Thanks, Bill. So I think it does link to the last question. I mean, I, I scribble down willingness to learn as the key uh, capability we need as leaders now, because in a disruptive age, if you think you've got the answers, you're, you're probably fooling yourself. So um, to the specific point about how we enable that shift in ways of working. I mean, it is worth bearing in mind that those of us at the top of the stack might have a very different view about the benefits of remote working than those at the bottom. So, you know, we need that, that, that linkage there. And, you know, that actually there's an awful lot of good work going on with reverse mentoring and a whole, whole bunch of stuff to try and overcome those things. Siobhan spoke quite a bit about that. Um, clearly there's a lot about tools here. Put my hands up, we in Defence Digital, that's on us um, in part. Um, I think it's a partnership. It involves some money and some prioritization. And then for the whole organization, it really is about how we use those tools in a much more, in a much more beneficial way. And as Siobhan said, that has to be from a conversation, uh, but a conversation across all the different tribes in defense uh, with all of our different languages and funny traditions and, and, and existing ways of working. But I think, you know, it's exactly the sort of integrating conversation we need anywhere across defence, you know, even if we hadn't just had a, a COVID crisis. So I would, as a cup half full kind of person, I would see that as an opportunity, certainly not a threat. Um, and I think we just need to listen 
to, to people's thoughts on it uh, and then get a good way forward, recognising that perfect ways forward are just not the thing these days. That's all. Thank you. Coming to you next, John Nick. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a slightly contrary view, I suppose, just to spice things up uh, and that's to say that we're all focused on remote working in the office place and the benefits that brings and how that's unlocking people and we've certainly experienced that um, here where our normal Friday clear lower decks is now done online so we get twice as many people and they've all got the confidence to put their hands up but they didn't when the chief of joint operations was glaring them in the eye but it mustn't always be about the remote working it's about changing the culture and Remote working doesn't apply on the battlefield. I prefer my comments on commanding a warfighting division. Your, your soldiers don't have the internet on the battlefield, only your staff officers do. So you can't influence your soldiers through the internet in the same way you can your staff in PGHQ or your head office. Um, and in many cases, particularly where I work now, we're in secret or above secret, um, where General Tom is still working hard to give us all the tools we need to work remote, remotely at that level, but we can't do it yet. So I think we need to stop talking about, well, we need to keep talking about it, but we need to stop obsessing with the remote working business and revisit the cultural point that General Stan was talking about and I talked about this morning in the sort of chaos of commanding Scottish soldiers and, and the sort of Chinese parliament approach to how we used to do business there. And then whether we're online or whether we're forward talking to our troops and looking them in the whites of their eyes before they go into the FUP, or we're just back in the headquarters doing our daily business because there's no COVID reason not to be, and all the young people like to get together. Um, it's, it's fine for us at home, you know, with our wives and, and what have you, but if you're 20 and you just started your life in a headquarters, it's, it's a bit dull being at home um, with your parents, I suspect. At least that's what my daughter tells me. So I think it's about the cultural bit, and if we get that right, and our cultural approach to leadership and collective command um, or management, um, then whether we're remotely working from home or in the office shouldn't matter. Thank you. General Stan, over to you, particularly with your, your look at the, uh, the commercial sector. Um, uh, how do you think they're, they're viewing uh, the end of the year, hopefully? It, very varied. They don't know. I will tell you, there are some leaders who are proclaiming we're going back to the office with great confidence. Others are proclaiming the other. And there's this sense of they're just not sure. The real difference is going to be what do their competitors do? And so some of the ones that aren't confident and try to go back to the status quo ante and then find their competitors have found something that works better, which I think we all sort of believe is gonna be a hybrid of leveraging things faster and responding better. But, but there's no confidence in the business community that they know what the right answer is. I just circle back around on the, the, the communications part, tell a short story. I, I went on an operation with Tutu SAS when we were all working together in Baghdad, like 2006 or seven, and the squadron sergeant major, I was just going along to, to show the flag, but I, but I was gonna try not to get shot in the process. The squadron sergeant major gave the operations brief, told everybody where to go, what to do. I didn't understand a single word he said. And I, I remember then getting on the helicopter thinking I'm a dead man. There was a, um, we talked at the start about um, when leadership goes well and, and the, the important leadership qualities. There's a question from um, Scott Walker, Lance Scott Walker, saying there can be a default amongst some leaders to go to a command style and that trying to break that when you do, uh, see, in his words, you get shot down very quickly. Uh, what would be the, the panel's advice about how to break that from, from the bottom up? Uh, if you like. Um, I think, General Stan, if we come to you first, and we'll then uh, probably come to Siobhan after that. Yeah, I think the first to understand it, there's a certain pressure to go to the command style, whether it's a board of directors telling you, they'll sometimes look and they'll go, leader, make a decision, or they'll use the excuse that we're in a crisis mode and therefore time doesn't allow you to be collaborative. And the answer is, that's rarely the case in my position. So I think the first thing to do is you've got to set up processes and, and a culture that allows the collaborative process to occur very, very quickly and organically. If you have to create it from whole cloth each time, the participants won't be very good at it. So this is something you create before the, uh, the operation of the crisis that you're dealing with. Feedback, feedback, 
feedback. So there's a few questions on the Slido I've noticed around things like psychometric assessment, about 180, 360 degree feedback. I think one of the things that's much more commonly talked about in my experience at any rate in the commercial sector is the nature of situational leadership. So how do you choose the right leadership style for the right moment? Um, and I think sometimes the only way that we can know whether we've done that is through getting really clear, honest, direct feedback from those around us. Um, so that would be my thought. We'll come to you then when we move on to the next question. I can see you're itching. Well, I think it's, it's a really important point. Um, I'd just offer two, two thoughts. Firstly, recognize that if your boss is being a bit of a dick, it may well mean that he or she is scared. It may be their first time as a section commander. It might be their first time in combat. Um, it might be that they're being pressured a bit from their boss and recognize you know, that, that they are human too, however hard they're trying to pretend not to be, and that there might be a bit of adrenaline flowing through them too. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing, which, which Brigadier Bill will remember, is uh, lessons from playing liar dice as a young subaltern. Leave an out in the box. Leave some room for them to withdraw from their position with a little bit of honour. If you close down all that manoeuvre space, they may just fight harder for the position they're in. So uh, deploy a bit of humour uh, and leave a bit of space for them to manoeuvre out of the situation. A great top tip, thank you. Um, hopefully that, that answer giving you some, some good advice. Um, moving on now to, and it links nicely with, with this afternoon's session, um, a question from, from Katie Yardley, which has come up in a number of, uh, of different ways. But her, her question is, the Milgram experiment raised the importance of seeing the person or the personnel impacted by your decision to ensure that you fully thought through that in a people-centered culture. Um, examples exist of failed leadership where leaders are too distant from impact and how can this gap be closed when leading remotely? Um, and that, as many of the audience will know, Margaret Heffernan's book on willful blindness and a whole number of studies recently about that, about that distance. General Stan, if we, if we come to you and then, uh, and then General Nick after that. On one hand, I understand the willful blindness. On the other hand, uh, the US General Grant during the Civil War stopped visiting hospitals because he found if he went to the hospitals and he saw that the carnage that was coming from the operations he was directing, he would lose his nerve to prosecute the war in the way he thought he needed to. So there are two sides to this. We have sometimes got to make tough decisions that are hard on people. And so I think we as leaders, this is, this is where uh, understanding the impact of your decisions is critical but not losing your nerve. You can't become just a weather vane. Thanks. So uh, I'd say, um, I think the advantage we have in the military, which I'm not sure is the case in all walks of civilian life, is we all started at the bottom. We all started as officer cadets or private soldiers. We all did basic training. We all stagged on the front gate of Sandhurst. We all dug trenches. Um, so I think we're fortunate we have an empathy with our soldiers. And the trick's not to lose it as you go up the chain of command. And again, the, the military culture of visiting is very important, difficult sometimes on a remote battlefield, but still really important. And, and that's why commanders do battlefield circulation, so they can get all that cheap abuse from their soldiers when they go around and see how they're going, um, which is, is very grounding. Do you remember the story about Roman emperors coming back from victories or Roman generals? And as they ride through a triumph in Rome, they always have a captured slave who whispers in their ear, remember your mortal, remember your mortal so that they don't get too much hubris. And I think that's really important too. So you've got to surround yourself with mates, and this is where the British regimental system is so good because you grew up with people who knew you as second lieutenants and now they're Sergeant Majors of the RSM and they can clip you around the ear and, and whisper in your ear. And, and the, the Sergeant Major system that we've now taken beyond the battalion level, that we've um, taken from uh, shamelessly from the US system, I think is really helpful for that. So having that Sergeant Major network, it doesn't have to be a Sergeant Major, but that's what they're there for, um, to whisper in people's ear and say, remember your mortal is really important. Um, thank you, John. We've got time, I think, for, for one more question. And then I have um, a yes or no challenge that has been presented uh, to the board and uh, um, we'll sweep up with, uh, with that. So uh, the, the question, uh, is, uh, is there a reason we're focusing so heavily on heavy war fighting and reminiscing about World War II over the last five years, and this year in particular? Um, and have we shown our true and most impactful leadership will not be in these areas? 
will we fail because we refuse to, refuse to acknowledge those days, are, those days are over? And it links to a very clever question as well about are we at risk of becoming a hedgehog? Are we investing too much in combat and too little in digitization and future capabilities? Um, I'll come around the, the whole board uh, with this one. I think a good place to start probably is with General Tom. Major General announced what he thinks going to happen in the integrated review before it's released. <laughs> probably not. Um, so one point, I, I think if you study World War II, you'll find plenty of reference to the importance of not what you're talking about there, combat, um, the, the extreme role of, of the whole panoply of, of warfare and a lot of it irregular warfare that, that we might now call competition. You just need to look at the different theatres that don't often get celebrated. Do we need to invest more in, uh, in the new stuff? Yeah, we do. But is there an awful lot to be gained and preserved from the old stuff, particularly in cultural terms? Oh, yes. You know, the nature of war is not changing. Uh, AI, after I'm long dead, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Machines not being scared of being killed. Maybe that might change the nature. But right now it's the character changing and the nature is preserved. So we need to lock into that whilst recognising that the character is changing and we do need to invest in those tools. The question brings to mind for me something that Mi Anton Judge, who's a, an organisational development expert, often says, which is that there is no right or wrong culture, but there is a wrong culture for what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so I think if we if we do feel as though what it is that we are going after um, is changing and shifting significantly, then it is wise of us to reflect on what are the aspects culturally that we need to take with us into the future, what are the aspects that we need to leave behind or moderate in some way. And I'd connect that to the attraction of scarce skills. Um, so defense, I think, has one of the most fantastic opportunities in many organizations I know in that it can attract a wide range of people through multiple different employment brands, brands and propositions. There are very few other organizations that have that benefit and that can do that. Um, and that really gives us fabulous competitive advantage in this environment where we really need to attract scarce skills. So I think how we go about doing that how we go about making a benefit of our culture but keeping an eye on what we might need to change for the future um, is a really important question yeah thanks uh, siobhan said something earlier about curiosity and i think that if i wanted anything to be central in the culture of an organization now it would be adaptability which is going to be allied to curiosity because we don't know what the next challenge is going to be I don't think anybody knows, even the opponents don't know. So the reality is I think it's gonna be how quickly you learn and how quickly you adapt. And then the tools to be able to do that, that the digital skills and whatnot, all connected to a powerful culture, like General Tom talked about, something that knits us together culturally. Um, so I think CGS answered that question this morning um, quite clearly by acknowledging that we need to you know, acknowledge that we've got an industrialized Cold War army and we need to prepare it for the digital future age. Um, but I think probably agreeing with General Stan, we need to be a bit careful we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Second Guard's tank army has still got over 2,000 tanks and, you know, we need to find a way of doing both. There are three divisions in the British Army and only one of them does heavy war fighting, but it needs to learn to do it in the future battlefield environment. And to paraphrase a previous sage, you may not be interested in heavy warfare, but it may be interested in you. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the last challenge, uh, which has been set you, just to allow that sort of, you to get nervous about what the question, uh, what the question might be. Uh, yes or no answers only allowed. Um, thank you very much for all your time uh, this morning. We have had literally hundreds of questions coming in um, over the social media. Uh, and some really, really good questions. Um, I mind them all up later on some Curtis Skinner, Curtis Skinner, Chris Kellogg, a host of really good ones, which we'll try and come to after this because they all deserve, uh, they all deserve answering um, or, or consideration. Um, the challenge for you, and it's anonymous, uh, or it's come off of my system as anonymous. Will any of the speakers today be brave enough to state that whilst being technology, technology illiterate was once a lovable trait. It now makes individuals combat ineffective and a millstone to our most important defense outputs. I shall go around the panel, Siobhan. No, I would never describe any human being as a millstone, but <laughs> I think it is 
really, really critical that we all accept living in the world that we're living in. Um, how we actually create safe spaces and environments in which people can admit what they don't know um, and be helped to actually understand and, and kind of drawn into um, this sort of world of technology, I think is a really important question. I'm sure that's right. And I'm feeling good because I managed to show my ADC how to work the camera on my laptop this morning. No question. <laughs> General Tom. I think I said it earlier. It, there was once a time when getting your ADC to print your emails gave you some weird combat credibility. Those days are gone. But anybody who thinks they've cracked it all is just waiting for disaster to happen tomorrow. Thanks very much. And by the way, I'd be delighted to try and answer some of those questions, provided you don't put too tight a deadline on it um, in, in due course. <laughs> Thank you. And I agree with the rest of the panelists, absolutely. To the panel, that closes this morning's session. It has been, uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your time. Uh, for all the, uh, the attendees, that closes this morning's session. We will keep the link live, so you don't need to log out. Um, if you do log out, uh, please, you can, easy to log on again. We are starting again at 13.30 uh, at with a fan another fantastic lineup uh, of speakers this afternoon. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Welcome to the afternoon session of our conference on remote leadership. I'm Dr. Linda Risso and I'm senior researcher at the CAL. This afternoon, we will pick up on some of the topics we discussed this morning and have insights from the, um, from the higher education sector and the business world. Our three speakers will give their, their insight and then we will have a debate at the end. So please do keep your questions coming via the, the Slido app. The first speaker is Dr. Sarah Perry, who is Associate Professor of Management at Baylor University in the United States. She helps lead a human resource management program in the Department of Management, and she teaches courses related to talent acquisition and conflict resolution. Dr. Perry has been consulted for expertise on remote work by the New York Times, Fast Company, and numerous other press outlets. Dr. Perry earned her PhD in industrial organizational psychology from the University of Houston and a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science from the University of Missouri. Today, Dr. Perry will talk about human impact on working and leading remotely. Dr. Perry, to you. Hello, thank you. I work in, I do my research primarily in the area of remote work and uh, well-being of employees and leaders. So this is really a great intersection of where I spend a lot of my time. Um, my info that is there and I'll share it at the end again as well. So I am currently in the middle of several research projects and uh, I'm gonna share with you, in addition to some general best practices, I'm gonna share with you some details of my research findings most recently. <clears throat> so this is a timeline that we are all familiar with. Um, from my perspective of the research I've been doing, and I'm gonna share some of the steps we've been taking. So we did a survey uh, back in December and January of US couples who were, uh, one of them was a remote worker and worked full time. The other could be a remote worker or not. It ended up about uh, 560 couples participated. And out of those about 360 were dual earner couples. And so then, uh, <laughs> well, this is overall, but as we continued to collect data, the COVID outbreak began and spread and the lockdown measures started in the U.S. around March. And uh, so we continued to collect data during that time. We had a lot more remote workers during that time. And uh, at the same time, I was collaborating with some others on an international survey of how people were doing and adjusting to the sudden shift in remote work. And then in May, uh, after the initial lockdown orders were lifted and states started doing their own thing and every state did something different, we were continuing to collect data during that time. So at that point was when we got to the, <clears throat> excuse me, about 560 um, couples who had participated. Now, this month, we're actually following up with those couples uh, and I have 390 here, but we actually realized we can include those who were from before COVID as well. So we're gonna see how they're doing, how things have changed for them over the past year and how they've reacted. 
Out of this sample, about half of them are non-traditional or new remote workers, people who had not ever rem worked remotely before. And by virtue of their job, were actually, uh, you know, had to adjust, but quite a big adjustment. So that's something we're going to be following up on here. And we're actually seeking funding right now to continue that and look at some of the dynamics that have emerged, including how people take breaks in remote work and how that looks different for remote workers versus office workers. So a couple of quick findings. Uh, who was the most well-equipped? That's the first real question that a lot of people were asking uh, over the past year, really. So what we found in our findings over all of those efforts was that the people highlighted here really did the best in terms of the transition. They tended to report that they were enjoying. And the, the people listed here are primarily couples without kids or couples with kids who had extra support. So they tended to do report really good outcomes and, and actually enjoying it in the midst of the stress of the obvious pandemic. Uh, the most challenging household types were single parents or single parents who were working, who weren't single parents, but they were working or being at home with their kids while their spouse was not there. Um, and then just couples with kids with no extra support. And then those who were isolated, home alone. So people who were very, feeling a lot of that isolation really um, by being completely alone, especially during those initial months. And so what did we study? We looked at work-family conflict, family-to-work conflict. So these uh, forces going back and forth between the work and home domain. Um, people were feeling very overloaded in terms of work and family. Not a lot of support in this red box in particular, feeling like they didn't have enough support. Uh, and they also were not using their resources very well in terms of using the extra time they would find uh, that they had in remote work or using the extra flexibility. I'm gonna talk more about that. And they didn't feel ready to work remotely during that time. And so we also looked at family dynamics. And this is something that, although it's not a uh, organizational outcome, leaders should be really concerned about this. We found a really strong relationship between work-family conflict among these remote workers and the relationship being affected between the two partners, the spouses, and then that leading to a strong intent to quit for both partners. And that particularly was enhanced when people, when one spouse uh, was, felt that the remote worker was not pulling their weight at home, if you will. So that, that paper is under, uh, in progress, about to be under review. Uh, we also looked at this difference between newbies and vets, we call them for short. So the re new remote workers were these new people that had to really adjust uh, at, you know, pretty quickly. They had to adjust and figure out how to do all of this. So we found out that support at home and at work really mattered for them. But we also found that high schedule flexibility, too much of it, really ended up harming them. They felt like they had more work-family conflict. They felt like they had more work overload. And whereas the veteran remote workers, those who had done remote work before COVID, really, they needed more support at home. They needed more flexibility at home and in setting up the home. And that is something else I'm gonna talk about as a consideration for how to do this well. So in looking at the vets specifically, those who were experienced remote workers, we found that in general, before and after COVID, they felt a lower sense of control at home once COVID, the lockdown measures happened. They had less satisfaction with their work arrangement. They did not feel they could use their resources well. That's what resourcing identity was. They didn't feel they had as much flexibility. Obviously, we were all left with less flexibility during that time. And their psychological well being went down. They also felt there was a lot more permeability between across the work and family boundary, which makes a lot of sense. A lot of interruptions from both sides into the other domain of life. Interestingly, all of these things did not change. And the asterisks indicate the, the levels didn't change, but how much they mattered changed. So we found different relationships before and after COVID among these things with other uh, work and family outcomes. So a lot didn't change, but our worlds changed, the dynamics did. So I'm gonna share five keys, and these are based on my own research, what I've talked about here and what I've done in the past, but also the broad literature on remote work. 
And all of these really apply to leaders as they work remotely and as they lead remotely or as they have subordinates who are remote or distant from them. This also applies to employees. So any of us who find ourselves working from home, hopefully this will give, this will give you some good tidbits. So the first one is autonomy. We know that autonomy is important, really maybe one of the number one factors for successful remote work. And this means giving people discretion to figure out how to get their work done. This could be schedule flexibility. This could be location flexibility, but it could also be just making decisions and determining how the work should be done. So we found, uh, this is a paper I published in 2018. And this just shows you how the more remote you are in general, the more autonomy you need to sustain your well being. And you see on the y axis here is exhaustion. So this is burnout, it's the opposite of well being. So autonomy helps protect us in terms of well being. Low autonomy can actually hurt us the more that we work remotely. So the key lesson here is leaders, a lot of new leaders, especially are struggling with issues of trust in their employees. Uh, the lesson is do not try to micromanage from afar, but let's shift to a mindset of support from afar. And I'm gonna talk more about some specifics on that in the next couple of tips. The next one is uh, proactive communication. And this requires effort on both sides, the leader and the employee. So the leader really should set the tone and, and really even be proactive about telling their employee they need to communicate. So that this on, ongoing two-way performance management builds trust. So when you're working from home, you do have to be more proactive to share with your leader your outcomes, your results, the productivity, and really checking in. Because a lot of us, uh, rightly or wrongly, assume that out of sight is out of mind and watching Netflix on the couch. So we don't want to let anyone fall under those false assumptions or be a victim to us having that bias, which research has shown people have been more productive during COVID, even in the midst of a pandemic, that remote work has really gone well for a lot of people. So we know this can happen, but we have to communicate what we're, what we're doing, but also just to stay in touch and build that trust. The two cautions to avoid here is we wanna avoid technology domination. If you don't need to be on video conference, don't require video conference. Um, don't overcomplicate it. Don't do things that you could just accomplish on a phone call. Don't insist that you have to have this more advanced technology like we're all getting used to now. Also, we wanna avoid overscheduling. So one of the big things that's shown up in the research over the past year is an intensity of meetings, even more meetings than ever before. So we really have to be careful about that. If you don't need to have a meeting, don't have a meeting. Even if you're trying to stay in touch, figure out ways to communicate at, in the right amount, I guess, find that balance. Number three is boundaries. So this is, I have three types of boundaries here to consider. One is time. When you're working remotely or your, your employees are working remotely, you have to be, um, you have to think about what are our working hours. And one of the big risks of remote work in general is intensification or working more than we would have because we never, we don't have that clear transition of driving home from work or taking the, taking the subway home from work. So if we think about when am I gonna turn it on and when am I gonna turn it off and try to keep those boundaries that will protect employees and leaders from crossing those boundaries, whether, you are impeding on someone else's home life or you are impeding on your own home life. Uh, that transition time is important. This is one of the things we heard from a lot of our participants that they were missing when they started working from home, that time when they really wound down. So that commute home, when you listen to a podcast or talk to a friend on the phone, um, you might have to build some of that back in once you're a remote worker. And for leaders to encourage your employees to take proper breaks to transition from one task to another, but also to transition to home life at the end. These are some ways you can help your employees protect their well being. Space is another one. So at home, a lot of our, if we don't have a lot of space, really just everything happens in the same space. And this can be a real problem for our ability to focus, but also our uh, likelihood of burning out. So encourage, especially at the beginning, we saw leaders trying to figure this out, encouraging employees 
to find a space that's dedicated just for work, or at least while you're working during working hours, it's dedicated just for work. If it's the kitchen table or if you have an office, ideally having an office with the door, we all know that is ideal, but a lot of people just don't have that at home. So at least having a space you transition at the end of the day. So if you have a laptop and all of your work books or materials or whatever, be sure you put those away somewhere at the end of the day. That's another transition or a cue that now we're into off work hours so that we don't just keep working forever 24 seven. And expectations. We need to set appropriate expectations for ourselves and also for our coworkers, for our subordinates and with our family. So one of the risks is that family, if they're also home, uh, expect remote workers to help with other things. That was one of the things that came up in that um, marriage study I mentioned, that if I feel like you're here working, if I'm thinking about my spouse, but you're just working and you're not helping me, you're not taking good, making good use of your breaks to help me with you know, what I need you to do, <clears throat> excuse me, when you aren't working. So being proactive about uh, communicating those expectations, also in terms of interruptions and just norms for what you need while you work. And that leads into number four. So we have certain needs that we may or may not know are automatically met when we go to work, when we physically go to work. And when you're a leader, one of those needs is that you see your people and thereby assume that they are being productive and so what needs do you uh, really need to make up for, compensate for, or have met in a different way? Uh, I have a picture here of just a couple of office spaces, as simple as an office space. If you think about being in your office and not being interrupted by your kids, that's a need that's met when you come to work instead versus when you work at home and you never get that separation. Another one would be just the interaction. So isolation is a big concern in remote work. And leaders can help facilitate ways to facilitate connections. So some have done this through virtual, you know, social hours, um, even just coffee chats. The time when you're going to come, not necessarily talk about work, but you're going to maintain that social interaction. That also helps innovation. That helps us stay on um, good terms with each other so that we can have more impromptu brainstorming and innovating. Another way to think about this is what do you need to ask for? You can ask for it from your work or your leader. You can ask for it from your family. And this might be that you need certain equipment. It might be that you need certain boundaries set, those expectations that we talked about. So you might need to think about what you have to ask for that you wouldn't have to ask for at home. I want a really tangible example was uh, that I experienced early on was having two screens. I have two screens in my office at work and I didn't at home, I was working off a little laptop screen in addition to a very uncomfortable chair. So these very tangible things that our workplace could help us with and many did during this past year, uh, I ended up bringing my screens home so that I could just, I was gonna be working from home anyway and our workplace said, you know, take your stuff home if you need it. Uh, the next thing to think about is what can you do? So needs and resources in terms of your flexibility how can you use your time and flexibility in ways that actually help you, but also help those around you? So meeting goals for yourself, for your family, for your work. Remote work breaks are different than in-office breaks. And this is a project I'm working on right now. Um, using our breaks wisely, we found that people who use their breaks specifically for self-care and non-work goals, like making plans with family, uh, scheduling dentist appointments, things like that, both of those together actually resulted in the best outcomes. And I'll show you a picture. If you look at the red circle, this is the less optimal. So we looked at how the, um, the way you use breaks affects how you view the stress you experience in remote work. And so the red indicates kind of more um, undesirable outcomes. Specifically, hindrance appraisal is looking at stress as a bad thing. Challenge appraisal is looking at stress as a good thing. So we want to look at stress as a way um, the stressors that we experience could help us grow and learn and become a better professional, whereas hindrance stressors, all they do is burn us out. So the green circle is the, it, it reflects when people use breaks for both self-care and non-work goals. When they do that, they tend to view stress in a more positive light.
And then finally, the last key is that this will be different for every subordinate you have. So every person needs something just a little bit different. So I talk about this as individualized consideration. And what you see in this graph is the outcome is autonomy, need, satisfaction. This is just illustrating a point as one example that people who are lower in the personality trait of emotional stability, this is from the big five topology of personality. Um, if they're lower in emotional stability, they actually need less autonomy. They get their need for autonomy met much quicker than someone who's higher in emotional stability. So remember, I started at the beginning. The first key was you need to give people autonomy. And this is the caveat. Not everyone wants a lot of autonomy. And what this means is we have to figure out how to support people from afar in the way that they need. So some people do great with 100% autonomy, you know, leave me alone. I don't need interaction or interference. But others really need support and guidance along the way, especially as they're working remotely. So that leads us to just a quick conclusion, something to reflect on as we go. The, to discuss expectations in a way that we know a lot of things are coming in on us right now. There's just a lot of stress and a lot of demands and there are limited resources to deal with these. So having conversations with your employees about that can be a hugely valuable exercise. It can also help build trust and mutual respect. The fact that you care enough to talk about these things. Also, as we move forward, leaders really need to facilitate this process of learning. What have we learned from the past year? What do we know now about remote work that we didn't know before? What works well? What doesn't work well? What have we done in our pivot that has really been good for all of us? What do we need to keep doing? What do we need to avoid resuming? And then finally, checking in on each other. What can we learn from those who are handling this well? And how, what can we do for those who are not? doing so well right now, who's struggling, and how can we help them? So with that, we have a little bit of time. If anyone, I've seen the chat come in. I haven't been um, reading them, but if anyone wants to ask any questions or Dr. Rizzo, if you want to facilitate any questions, we can do that. The panel really brought together a lot of different insights into leadership in the business world and in academia. And what I think is particularly valuable about this panel is the fact that uh, the speakers have based their studies and their presentation on the groundbreaking data they've collected through surveys and through different projects. And we were very fortunate to listen to how they've analyzed them for us and to clearly package them into very helpful advice and insights. So we now move on into uh, the Q&A session with all our three speakers. And uh, the first question is for, uh, um, with, for Chris and Matthew about your expertise and how it can be applied to the Army, because you both have worked in one way or the other in close quarters with the Army. And one of the questions that we have received is, what are the largest barriers to the Army becoming a truly high-performing organization? Chris, would you like to go first? Um, thank you. Um, I think there's far more common between the army and uh, multinational corporations than might appear on the surface. As I explained, uh, I've worked for very large command and control organizations and uh, some of the common denominators with the army are really quite there. Army also has got some hidden benefits. Uh, and what I mean by that is people automatically assume and understand the chain of command and are therefore able to get stuff done better, faster, when it's really, really important to do so. Uh, the army is driven by people with a service ethos, uh, unlike uh, corporations where, of course, there is a service ethos there as well, but there is also a profit ethos also. I do believe, therefore, that the similarities are the good starting point for us to consider what we can do. I've now been uh, working with the Army in three capacities. One is uh, the uh, Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, one is Army HQ, and most recently with the Center for Army Leadership. What I've discovered is that the ability and the willingness to learn from the corporate world is immense, is tremendous. And I'm delighted, therefore, that when 
ideas that are floated are implemented and proven to work, then get rolled out. So my brief feedback would be, be willing to accept suggestions from the outside world, try them out in a pilot proof of concept manner. If they work, feel free to roll them across, you know, throughout the field army, for example. Uh, that would be my insight. Matthew? Well, thank you, Chris. And, and thank some wonderful comments coming in. I, I appreciate it very much. This has been a huge amount of fun to, to, to be a part of. Um, so I, one, a couple of things I, I would say, perhaps. First of all, is how grateful I am to the army. Um, the defense of democracy and the, our way of life is something of massive significance in historical terms. And what you have achieved over the course of your history is something of, of massive significance for the overall welfare of the planet. So I wanted to, if I may, take it from a geopolitical context, it, it, it's an extraordinary thing that you do. And so high performance in this particular institution has massive moral significance. Um, to, to, to perhaps one, one or two very brief observations. I know that Stanley McChrystal earlier, General McChrystal, talked a little about hierarchy and mentioned United Airlines 173, that classic aviation accident where there wasn't a good sharing of information up and down the chain of command and how if you want agility at scale, you really need that. I wanted to just make one other point, which is I think when one is coming up with a plan, when one is evaluating a plan, it really pays for people to be humble and to listen because there may be something of great significance that is said by somebody lower down the chain of command, up, higher up the chain of command, you need that humility. But I also think that once you're in the execution stage, it can make sense to, to be a bit more galvanizing and to say, you know what, let's get behind this. Because diverse perspectives when you're seeking to execute can often slow things down. Obviously you want to occasionally change direction in the light of new information. But if you look at that performance cycle, you see this in sport too. You know, David Beckham, when he's taking a free kick, massive confidence. Or a surgeon wielding the scalpel. You know, I'm good at this and I'm going to wield it well. You know, if they're thinking very humbly, I might mess this up, they're never going to be able to deliver with any conviction. But if the surgeon takes that confidence into the evaluation and review stage, you know, I'm perfect, there's nothing to learn, you don't ever get better. So, so Beckham, you know, when you're going for it, when you're executing, I think having that confidence and, and getting behind it with that frame of mind is an extremely positive thing. But it is not incompatible with the humility to say that when we're facing a complex problem and we are evaluating what to do, we really need to be to have some element of, of, of humility. And I, and I think the reason I mention this in the terms of the army is there is quite a clear and demarcated hierarchy that can sometimes suppress the flow of information. Now it's a question for all three of you. Uh, it's about the, the hybrid working environment and the challenges and opportunities that this brings. So uh, Sarah, would you like to start? Sure, I think we know from research that people who are in the office uh, can be more dissatisfied as a result of things that their remote colleagues do or don't do. And so keeping the expectations very clear and being proactive about that communication, I think is the number one consideration for that. I mean, we just have to know who's, not that we're micromanaging where everyone is, but knowing at a high level, where are people and what are the expectations of working from that mode? And that, I think that's number one for setting up the team for success and then keeping the channels open for ongoing communication without meeting overload. I would start by identifying people who say that they enjoy the hybrid working model. Um, gather 20 of them in a room or remotely, whatever, and just ask them, what is it that they enjoy about the hybrid model? I'm sure there's several common denominators in there and then try and implement as many of those common denominators as possible. Because what you've done is you've gone with the vast majority who want to do something. They are going to be your early adopters, your innovators. Uh, they're glad to do it. They get certain benefits out of it. Um, take their suggestions, implement them, and allow them to serve as the early adopters that then pull the early majority and the late majority along with them. And that's how you can get 
uh, a hybrid model embedded fairly quickly. Thank you, Chris. Matthew? Yeah, th th thank you. There's some interesting uh, research done on how to, by Lee Thompson at Northwestern University, about how to conduct virtual meetings in an effective way. I'm sure some of you will have read the different techniques that are used by leading organizations to make sure that there aren't uh, social conformity effects, that when someone speaks first, everyone starts to, as it were, congregate around that perspective. So certain types of conversational turn-taking uh, and other things of that kind, there's a very it's significant method uh, called the Delphi method that is used by a number of organizations. But what I've noticed a lot with uh, corporations over the last few months is in a hybrid working environment is trying to ensure equal voice from those that are physically present in the room and those who are not present in the room and only speaking via Zoom or Teams. Now, this is of great significance because it may well mean that certain people are downgraded because they don't have the peripheral vision to read the body language of those physically present as others are speaking and therefore can't triangulate towards meaningful contributions. So Amazon, well, I, I, Amazon is one of many that are trialing different ways of having hybrid meetings, which effectively exploit the perspectives of everyone who might have th something you sort of contribute. In my own judgment on this, for what it's worth at this stage, is to make sure there are cameras on everybody at the same time that can be seen by all participants. But I'd look forward to reading the evidence as it emerges. But it, it won't surprise you to say that this is something that is being thought of uh, as we speak. Thank you, Matthew. Chris, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, Dr. Riso, if I may add to something that Matthew said, uh, it's actually possible, uh, I've been doing this for about a decade or so, Matthew, what you do is you simply make sure that uh, if you're having a conference call with people from around the globe, you rotate leadership off the call every week. So, for example, you know, this week it's the U.S. leads, next week it's um, you know, some other geography, et cetera. What you discover is that whoever leads is also given the right to set the agenda for that meeting. They then prioritize the content of the meeting to suit them. Over the course of an entire cycle, you begin to understand all the various perspectives that would otherwise have been hidden if the meeting was always led by a particular geography or a particular person. So rotating leadership of the call is one way to achieve the objective. And I've been doing it for a while and it works. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. Now we have a question specifically for Sarah and it's about remote working as a working parent and how to juggle childcare, possibly homeschooling and home working. Thank you. Yes, this is dear to my heart. This is something I do. So I think setting um, appropriate expectations, depending on the age of your kids, if your kids are school age and they're doing their work at the same time you're doing your work, um, what's worked well for us, and this is anecdotal, I haven't done research on this, but what's worked well for us and really some of our qualitative data from our participants mentioned this, is really just setting up zones of where they're each working and setting frequent check-in times. One of the things that we run into is the interruptions can really be damaging for the worker. And we all know that, um, that from our kids, we need to engage with them if we're there, um, particularly school-age kids trying to do their own work. So just being clear about this, you know, kind of the schedule, I'm gonna be on a meeting now, don't interrupt, and then I'll check in with you. Or they know that I need to focus right now and I'm going to check in with you. So that kind of structure can help for little ones. It's hard, there's not a really good answer for that, except just do the best we can to try to, you know, occupy and get spurts of productivity. And it really, uh, I was talking to one researcher who said, um, his work was showing that people were getting deep work done. And as long as you get two and a half to three hours of deep work done per day, you're probably gonna be just as productive as you would be at the office. So if you can find those times, maybe early in the morning before they wake up late at night after they go to bed, um, that's a whole nother issue though, because we're all stretched so thin. So if we give up our you know, personal time when we need to be sleeping to work, uh, we have to think about balancing that too. And if I can push a little bit further on that, what can leaders do to support their team members who face these issues? So one of the big things is schedule flexibility and knowing that 
Um, we cannot micromanage from afar, as I had said, but we also have to give people the trust and the leeway to figure out how to get their work done and really focus on the results, not on what are you doing at this hour of the day, because they have to juggle so much. So we have to give them trust and freedom and really stay in touch over time about how is that going? How can we adjust? How can we tweak? Um, and what do you need from me to be able to do it? So that appropriate balance of guidance, support, and autonomy. No, perfect. Uh, the next question is for all three of you and is about loneliness and how to compensate for that in both in terms of remote working and in hybrid working environment. Uh, Chris, would you like to go first? Um, I find that a network, if you've gone around being uh, a decent remote leader, the chances are that you are unlikely, and again, I'm only just going to answer this from the leadership perspective as opposed to the team members. Uh, I'm sure Sarah and Matthew are better qualified to answer that. But if you do this from a remote leader perspective, as long as you have been someone that people feel that they can reach out to, you will serve as a sounding board for those who are having conversations with you that they don't really need to have, for which there is no direct business objective. And it's up to you to read between the lines and understand that they're reaching out to you because they're lonely. Um, wherever possible, it's important for a remote leader to make the time to have those conversations. Um, you do end up on days where you carry uh, an emotional burden far greater than you, know, you should as a, as a human being, which is where the me time point comes in. Uh, but all I can say is it's for whatever minutes you invest in listening to someone who's lonely, it pays it back 10 times over, 100 times over, 1,000 times over in the trust and loyalty it engenders. Because at some point in time, you're going to need their help. It may not be for your personal requirements, it may be for business requirements, but it's up to you to put in the investment first, pay it forward as it's commonly called, and I'm a great fan of doing so. Well, I think this is a very a brilliant question because I have to say, as, as, as a father of two children, Evie and Teddy are eight and seven, the pandemic has really put us into a very intense non lonely context. You know, we're, we're all living on top of each other with homeschooling and other things of that kind. And it was so interesting to listen to other people who are living alone, uh, who may have be earlier in their stage of life, and how devastated they've been by the lack of social contact. And the thing that hit me hardest about that is, is the importance for all of us, not just leaders, but all of us for empathy. You know, I've talked a bit about why diversity matters. But when we don't just hear what other people are saying, but truly listen to them, it acts as such a wonderful bridge between us. And I think it helps us to understand the different difficulties that each of us are facing in this pandemic and come up with sensible, rational responses to it. Whether it's networking events online, that may be superficial in terms of combating certain types of loneliness, but other things of that kind. I know that one of the big consultancy firms kept the offices open so that people who were feeling very lonely could, could come in. Um, and there were many more than they expected, uh, even during the, 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 the bottom of the pandemic. So yes, I, I, empathy is a, a hugely important quality, I think, for all of us. Yeah, I would just add that um... The, we all have this need to relate to others and to have this interaction, but it doesn't mean we need a lot. And it does vary by person, obviously. So anything we can do to put ourselves in a situation to be known and be heard, even in small snippets, can make a big difference. So like Chris said, if we can each invest in someone and we each make sure we're reaching out to someone, that's going to make a big difference. And we're going to get through this time where we're going to be able to have a lot more interaction. Um, so to get us through that, I think just managing that, um, balancing it, we don't need as much as we maybe usually get in the office. Thank you very much. And then another question, which was very popular, is that how do you manage low performance in a remote or hybrid working environment? Matthew, would you like to go first? 
Cool, that's an interesting question. How do you manage low performance? Yes. Well, let me have a crack at that. Let me have a crack at that. I think that the first thing that one would want to examine are the root causes. What, why is somebody performing poorly? The Western response too often is there must be a lack of discretionary effort. They're just not pulling their weight. There can often be systemic reasons for why things aren't going as well as they might do. And if you look at high performing industries, they're very good at trying to analyze the systemic explanations for why certain people who they've hired on the basis of their talent and passion are not doing as they should. And I think in a pandemic, it's particularly important to try and understand what those might be. But I would possibly add that if one has genuinely looked at what those might be and how they might be addressed, how one can support low performing people to bring them back into that high performance environment, and they continue to perform in, in a way that is, that is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, forgive me to, for making this point, I think it is acceptable at that point to say, well, maybe we're not going on the same bus in the same direction and uh, it's time for you to go. But I think it does make sense to, to try and do that initial investigation because that will encourage people to be open and honest about the challenges they're facing and that are easier to solve collectively. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, Sarah, would you like to go next? Sure, I think it comes down to the first, the first question has to be about why is it not going well, like Matthew said. And I, I, think, I think about things in terms of stress and how that influences performance. So I think of demands and resources and what is the balance? Of what demands do you have on you right now? Like let's, let's talk through those. And what resources do you have to address them? And what are you missing? And let's address those to see if we can address the problem. Chris? Um, Dr. Risso, I commented by parsing it into two to three different dimensions. The first dimension is, is the person who is a low performer now traditionally been a low performer in the physical world as well? Or is this a former high performer who's now become a low performer? The reason why I ask that question is, uh, <clears throat> there are many, many instances of high performers in multinational corporations who've gone on to be complete total disasters in startups, for example. That's because the reason they were high performers is there was an enabling environment within the global corporation that allowed them to be a high performer. And that network, that support system has now been taken away. I would then, as uh, just following up from Matthew and Sarah's points about root causes, I'd actually want to find out very, very quickly if the root causes are professional or personal. If they're personal, um, I would give a tremendous amount of latitude could be kids uh, sharing a house with too many people or something to that effect, um, I'd give us a lot more latitude. If they're professional in that um, at work, there was enough peer pressure and direct supervision to keep them on track, but now that it doesn't exist and they've decided to you know, lay in bed till 3 a.m., I mean, sorry, 11 a.m. or whatever it is, uh, then you'd want to address that. So root causes, broadest classification, personal versus professional, and be very kind on the personal front. Thank you very much to all of you. Last qu one question, which is actually my own question, is that we often speak about diversity in terms of race, gender, but we never speak in terms of age. How has age impacted on remote working and how will it impact hybrid working? Thank you very much. Uh, Chris? Um, what I am discovering is that uh, as someone with silver hair, if I wish to be, I'm finding that it's definitely harder to be employed, but not necessarily harder to be employable as you get uh, more and more experienced and more and more mature. The trick to getting into employment for uh, more mature people is to demonstrate their value where possible in a project type environment, in a contract, a fixed term type environment, uh, maybe even serve on the board of the company that they're looking to join. What that does is it demonstrates the wealth of knowledge, skills and experience that they have, which then invariably leads the employer to make them an offer to convert them from their original status. 
that's the best route that I've found for people um, of maturity looking to find work. Thank you very much. Matthew, would you like to go next? In terms of age, it's interesting, Chris, who has grey hair, I have none whatsoever. Well, I have a, a tiny bit. Uh, I'll shave what is currently there a bit later today. Um, but I, I thought <laughs> I thought of this from the, from the perspective of, of younger people. Um, a lot of companies now use shadow boards, if that makes sense. So, so if you imagine one's age often comes with a whole range of assumptions, social and otherwise, that inform the way one thinks about the world, sometimes called paradigms. This happens in science, it happens in corporations. And shadow boards is where younger people get direct access to the decision-making executives, and therefore may have tacit knowledge uh, about how young people are thinking, about their aspirations, about how they're engaging with digital technology. So a lot of companies are using this, particularly when some of their consumers are young or even just when they have young employees and they need to try and understand how they're thinking and feeling. Chris makes a very good point that you don't want to neglect people who are older too. So I think having that age-based diversity is extremely important. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning to come to the point of a virtual world is both David Solomon, who's the new chief executive, well, new, he's been there over a year now at Goldman Sachs, but also, I spoke a couple of days ago to the senior partner at PwC. Both of them are worried about how a virtual world makes mentoring more difficult. I use that word tacit knowledge. It's often you need to see how people are doing things rather than merely formal instruction in order to figure out how to do them yourself. And therefore, I think it does take a bit of thought about how to ensure that younger people are getting really authentic mentoring when they're not actually physically in the same. By the way, there's a big book coming out by Joe Henrik of Harvard University about how tacit knowledge is crucial for innovation and how, well, I don't want to get into politically controversial terrain, but how, uh, well, I won't mention it, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a very good thing. T tacit knowledge uh, is important and I, and I think it's worth, bear it, <laughs> worth bearing in mind. Thank you very much, Sarah. I agree with everything that they've said. I think in terms of remote work, um, and I was thinking of it from the perspective of enabling remote work for all ages and, you know, across the diversity of the workforce. And I think it still comes back to um, what resources do you need and what individual preferences and um, maybe extra needs you have to get set up and resource. So it doesn't matter what age you are, but you might stereotype that maybe the older members of our workforce might take a little bit more help or whatever um, in setting up technology, but that's a vast overgeneralization and shouldn't probably even say it. But if you think about what difference does age make in terms of remote work, I think a lot of what um, Matthew just said about the tacit knowledge is, is huge because if they're just, if you're more mature members of your workforce that people can learn from are at home and nobody ever sees them, there are just vast amounts of information that no one's learning implicitly. So that's something to consider for how to create those connections again. Thank you very much. And with this, I'd like to thank all three of you for your very helpful insights and information that you provide us with. And I know from the amount of questions that come, we have received that our audience is thrilled with your papers. And now I leave the floor to <laughs> you tell Colonel <laughs> Langley Sharp, who is the head of the Center for Army Leadership. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've been given the unenviable task of closing the, uh, the conference today, but I certainly won't seek to summarize because I, I just don't think I'll give justice to the, the rich insight, the breadth and depth from all our speakers today. Um, all, uh, at the very least, I hope we've brought the, the luggage people and the wheel people together. Um, I do think it's interesting to note, however, uh, a number of themes that have resonated throughout all of our speakers today. Uh, change and the pace of change, as CGS mentioned right at the beginning. Command, mission command, collective command. The whole raft of personal attributes and skills that people have been speaking of. Empathy, humility, self-discipline, compassion, innovation, creativity. The importance of learning, the importance of trust, and of course, culture which has been repeated throughout the day. Uh, none of this would have been possible without two key groupings. Firstly, you, the audience, for engaging with us today, 
and for offering so many thought-provoking questions that really have been the value of, of, of the event. And, uh, and particularly those who have joined us from around the world, um, conscious that you are, you are joining us at all hours of the day. And of course, to our speakers, to all our panelists that have represented here today, from four-star generals to a world champion ping pong player. Um, thank you very much indeed for giving up your, your valuable time and from, for sharing your, your expertise and, and your experience. It's, it's hugely welcomed. I'd like to leave you with uh, two final thoughts. The first to say is the day is not over. And if we are all gonna get the most value out of us today, we must reflect and of course take subsequent action. To that end, I urge you all to ask uh, of yourself, what have you learned today? And more importantly, what are you gonna do differently with what you've learned? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to your context? And what actions are you gonna to take tomorrow to make yourself a better leader? And my fi final thought takes us back to the why. Why are we here and why are we talking about leadership? To the British Army, leadership underpins everything we do. And ultimately, it's about delivering our operational effectiveness. It's about delivering mission success. And when you strip away the, the process, the procedures, the structures, the technology, the tactics, the doctrine, it all boils down to people, our people. And it's our people that deliver operational success. And of course, that, there's parallels across the wider military and civilian community. Leadership is about people. I open with Field Marshal Slim, and I'd like to close with Field Marshal Slim with an extract from the final paragraph of the final chapter of his 1956 book, Defeat into Victory. And he said, yet there is one thought that I would like to be the overall and final impression of this book, that the war in Burma was a soldier's war. There comes a moment in every battle against a stubborn enemy when the result hangs in the balance. Then the general, no matter how skillful and far-sighted they may be, must hand over to the soldiers and leave them to complete what they have begun. So it remains incumbent on, on us all to remember who we are leading and why. With that, I thank you very much for your attendance today and bid you farewell and stay safe. <laughs>